relentless rise of the East Indian Company and Empire. We have with us the most distinguished guests ever possible. As he walks on the stage, Sir Mark Tully. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he needs no introduction, but however, Sir Mark Tully, KBE, is one of the former bureau chief of BBC, and he has worked for 30 years before he resigned in July 1994. He has held the position of chief of bureau BBC, Delhi. Well, he was awarded with the Order of British Empire 1985, Padma Shri in 1992, BAFTA Award for Lifelong Achievement in 1985, and was knighted in 2002 receiving a KBE, and he's Padma Bhushan in 2005. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Mark Tully. We also have with us Mr. Walter Reed, a lawyer and a historian, Fellow of the Historical Society of UK, and he specifically um, specializes in the British Imperial policy. He's the author and he's written books, um, Keeping the Jewel in the Crown, The British Betrayal of India, and at the moment is working on another book called Churchill in India. We have Mr. Oliver Everett, he was um, he's in the British Diplomatic Service, served in the UK High Commission, Delhi, from 1969 to 73. He was the Assistant Private Secretary to Prince Charles from 1978 to 1980, and then Private Secretary to Diana and Prince of Wales in 1981 to 83. He was a Queen's Librarian in the Royal, Royal Library, Windsor Castle, 1984 to 2002, and is now the Librarian of Emeritus. Ladies and gentlemen, the panel discussion. The anarchy and the rest, relentless rise of East India Company and Empire. All yours, sir. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, oh, it's working. Hmm. Well, we're, we're gathered here to consider um, a book uh, which has just been published by William Dalrymple, who has written several other um, books, remarkable books in India. And his book is on the history of the East India Company, although it doesn't actually um, uh, cover the full period of the East India Company, but it covers basically that period in the 18th century when um, the company rose from uh, being basically a trading organization to an organization which laid the foundations for um, Britain ruling India. Um, and um, with all uh, William's books, uh, they are extremely well written. This is a very thick book but you shouldn't let the thickness put you off because it's extremely readable. Um, it has some very exciting stories of battles in it and it's extremely lucid and clear as well. Um, but it does give a chance for us to talk about uh, Willie's book and also more generally we'll talk about the rise of the British in India and um, how, how uh, inevitable that was, how relentless it was or was not, and raise various questions like that. And we'll end probably uh, by asking the question everyone always asks, was it a good idea for us to be there at all? Um, I say us because, of course, you have a strange situation of three Britishers um, uh, discussing this book, um, although I do have a overseas citizenship of India as well. So let me start, Walter, then, with asking you, um, uh, so that we get a sense of this book. Um, there's been many other histories of the uh, East India Company written. Um, but there's a big fuss, or this one gets a lot of publicity, 
put it like that. Um, what, is, what is special about this one? Well, um, I think the f what can be said about it is that it's a, an attractive book in every sense. It's a, it's a big, substantial, attractive book. I, last time I met Willie Dorimple, he could probably describe it as being big and attractive too. But unlike um, Willie, it comes with a little silk bookmark hanging down, which lends it a lot of class. But it's an attractively written book. It's an attractively produced book. Um, there have been, as Sir Marcus said, there have been other books about the East India Company. Some of them are quite good. John Kay's book is very well known. Um, Willie's book doesn't, I think, really add a lot to what we know about the essence of the East India Company. But he tells the story with great verve and vigor. It's a very accessible story. A little too long, in my view, but uh, we could perhaps talk about that later, but uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, uh, it doesn't add an awful lot, but it will, because of its accessibility, it will appeal to a lot of readers who know less about the history of the company and of India than this very well-informed audience does. It's already attracted, as you know, some very favorable reviews in India and also to an extent in Britain. Uh, and I think given the celebrity and the charm of its author, it will sell well and deserves to be read. But I, I think for people who are coming with a knowledge of the subject and wanting to extend that knowledge, it's probably not, the, not a book that will give them a lot of new information. William always, um, in all his books as I remember them on India, he manages with the help of his colleagues um, to dig out documents which have not been used before. And in this book, he mentions uh, some of the documents and he mentions uh, the, his colleague. Um, to what extent do those documents add anything to our knowledge? In my view, but I, I'm not a specialist in the company history. I know more of my, my speciality really, if I can call it that in relation to India, uh, it follows from a book called Keeping the Jewel in the Crown, which is at the back of the hall, and it's described, uh, Keeping the Jewel in the Crown, the British betrayal of India. So my, uh, I've tended to look at the uh, inconsistencies and uh, untruths of British policy in relation to India. Um, as far as I can tell, however, the... Um, the new material, and there's a lot of it, doesn't take us very far forward. And indeed, I said a moment ago that I think the book is rather too long. Um, I think it would read better and more crisply if there was less extended quotation. He brings in some lovely anecdotes. If you want the anecdotes, they're there. I don't think they add a lot to the historiographical content of the book, but there are lovely stories, but they are long indented paragraphs where I think a footnote of reference or perhaps a, a, a sentence or two would have been enough. Um, so it depends if you want. If you want a book for flicking through and enjoying, savoring anecdotes, getting a feel for the history, this new material helps, but it's not directly relevant to the historical account. Uh, well, um, what, what do you say, first of all, uh, Oliver, would you give your view of the book in general? Why is it important? Is it particularly important? I, I think it is uh, because primarily it puts it in the context of what, in, what was happening at India at the time because the title itself, The Anarchy, um, as you know, referred to the collapse of the Mughal Empire. And if the Mughal Empire had not collapsed, I don't think the British would have come or been able to come uh, into India. Um, and it was, um, that is why Willie um, emphasizes that uh, India was in a, in a poor state because uh, the uh, Mughal Empire had come into uh, such disarray. And then of course, um, in 1739, there was the invasion from Nadir Shah um, 1761, there was um, the Afghan uh, invasion. So really, India was in a bad way 
um, and it was Britain who found itself being pulled into an India that was unstable um, because uh, of what had happened to the Mughal Empire. Of course, there are uh, views of history now uh, which would rather contest the, the views of the anarchy, aren't there? There are some views of history which uh, take the view that actually there was a whole lot of stability in India in spite of the um, Mughal Empire gradually crumbling away um, and that it was the British in a way which created the anarchy. The, I think Britain found a, a fairly um, um, a disorganized state. I mean, the point uh, that Willie has made and others have before him is that if uh, India had united uh, at any time from the mid 18th century, um, they could have easily um, uh, got rid of the British. Um, if they had been unified as it was, they were divided. Some people say that Britain uh, was guilty of divide and rule. In fact, it was India that was already divided in one sense. Yes. Well, I think we'll come on later to more about the divide and rule and the crimes of the British. Yep. Um, but uh, could you also say briefly, uh, uh, as Walter has done, why um, you therefore think that, uh, um, or whether you think that there are too many quotations, too much use of documents. I, my, I myself like those quotations. Um, they are by um, uh, renowned and contemporary uh, Indian scholars. And I think that gave, gives you a feel of what uh, Indian historians were thinking about the situation at the time. Because a lot of those uh, quotes were not recent quotes, they were quotes from the actual time. So that, for me, took me into that period. And I felt that, uh, that uh, people at that time were speaking to me about uh, what was going on. Yes, I think that's a very important point. Um, one of the phrases which is used in the book and about the book, they talk about the restless, um, relentless advance of the British. And there's a sort of suggestion that um, it was an ine inevitability about it all. And uh, it seems to me that uh, we tend to forget the defeats that the British suffered, like uh, Baksa, for instance, was a near defeat, um, the, the defeat against, uh, the defeats against Haider Ali um, in, my, in Mysore, um, and the fact that treachery played uh, such a big part so, to what extent um, do you think it was inevitable or relentless, or a process going on? I don't think it was um, either relentless or inevitable. Hmm. Um, if um, if, if um, members of the Indian nation had come together, um, it wouldn't have been... And if the, the French uh, weren't there, I mean, the French might have done better than they did. And I think it's quite possible that um, as you say, Buxar might have been lost as Willie. I think that was, for me, one of the good things about the book. The Battle of Buxar is well known to us, uh, but what I didn't know is that we, um, we the British in this case, nearly, as you said, lost the battle. Could I come in on yes, that? Course, I'll just to mm -hmm. follow up slightly on that. I, um, it, yes, it wasn't relentless. It wasn't inevitable. Uh, apart from the military threats from first of all perhaps from France and then from within India itself. Uh, there was a, an economic uh, weakness which was never totally absent despite the great financial success of the uh, company uh, and the British government had to step in for instance after the famine of 1770 to, to help uh, out a company which might otherwise have failed. Um, it's probably relevant to this also just to try to put into put the, the rise of the company in, in the 18th century against the economic context. This is an area which I don't think Willie really brings out. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier um, when you uh, talked about the, the anarchy. Um, I'm not absolutely clear what he means by the anarchy. The anarchy has a technical sense in, in English, in Indian history, but he tends to use it a little bit uh, to describe the company itself. There are really three views 
three economic views about why the company grew in the 18th century. The traditional 19th century view, which was expressed, for instance, by James Mill, the Scottish um, uh, economic philosopher, uh, he said that there was this anarchy, this, this vacuum created by the collapse of the Mughal Empire and that into this vacuum came the East India Company and this was extended by the 19th century views of the beneficial nature of British intervention. Uh, but even quite recently, Neil Ferguson in his book Empire argues um, that the intervention of the East India Company was a useful device in that it allowed capitalism to flourish as a means of disseminating, for instance, the rule of law, parliamentary assemblies, and so on. That uh, classical view, if you like, was challenged uh, about 50 years ago by economists at Cambridge University. They said that the Mughal Empire didn't create a vacuum or an anarchy. They said that, in fact, it was a time of relative prosperity, financial growth, economic development. More recently, uh, people like Tuskanda Roy, who is a professor of economics at the London School of University, uh, and his associates have said, yep, there was a flourishing economy, indigenous flourishing economy in India after the collapse of the Mughal Empire, but that the systems which relied on uh, tax systems in particular were flawed. They relied on loyalty of feudal overlords. The British, on the other hand, according to this school, had a professional army and they established an efficient land tax system. Um, so on this view, neither the company nor, the, nor India as it existed represented anarchy in any true sense. Now, I, a major criticism of this book in my view would be that in a book which is dealing essentially with an economic entity, the East India Company, he doesn't consider the economic and the financial arguments. It seems to me, Oliver, I don't want to say that actually economics doesn't really figure that much in the book. That's, that's absolutely true, but in, on the question of relentless, um, mm. I found it interesting that uh, Robert Clive uh, when he went back to Britain, he had misbehaved fairly spectacularly. Uh, he was a very brave soldier um, and rather a daring one. But when he came back, um, two things. He started to reform the bad behavior uh, of the East India Company officials, which was indeed very bad behavior. Um, and he turned, it was rather like what we call a poacher turned gamekeeper. Uh, he was trying to stop the East India Company doing exactly what he had done by abusing uh, his position uh, in India. Also, um, he decided, the second thing was that he, as governor of um, uh, Calcutta at the time, he decided that the British should not, the East India Company, should not extend its territorial uh, position outside uh, Bihar and Arissa and Bengal. He wanted to limit it because he realized it would be a liability. And that's exactly what Warren Hastings, the first governor general, also said that the policy should be not to expand British territory. But what happened, as we can go on and Willie does, um, they were drawn into other areas because of instability in those areas, which made trading difficult. Did of course, I, uh, Willem was uh, harsh on Clive and very much in favour of Warren Hastings, wasn't he? Absolutely, yes. He, he made clear that um, Hastings, and I agree, Hastings was a very good thing, I think, mm. in terms of his attitude towards India. Uh, Warren Hastings thought it was very important for the British to understand India, to learn their languages. Uh, he encouraged um, a man to be the first man to learn Sanskrit, a man called Charles Wilkins. Um, he got him to translate the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which Warren Hastings thought was a wonderful book. Um, so uh, Warren Hastings, I think, uh, was on the side of Britain's responsible um, um, behavior in, Brit in India. And paid a heavy price for it, didn't well, he? Well, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Walter, going uh, on with this question of the British and why they uh, got there, whether it was a re 
relentless and all that. Um, we're in a, a military audience here, a military uh, festival of military literature. So we must talk about the battles and the whether, to what extent, the eventual results was a result of British military superiority, either in tactics or in equipment. Well, I'm not really the best person to answer that, but I, and I would defer to, to Oliver. Uh, my view is that initially Britain uh, was militarily quite advanced, having studied the weapons, the weaponry, and the tactics of Frederick the Great, for instance, in, in mainland Europe. Um, latterly, the French um, and the Indians, the Indians, native Indian armies, uh, very rapidly adopted the same sort of strategy and the same sort of weaponry uh, as uh, Britain had uh, got in on early. Uh, and I think Britain's military um, uh, position strengthened. They, I mean, the, the, the kind of wider aspect of the same question, I suppose, is not simply how strong we were militarily and why we prevailed over the French and the, um, the, the native rulers, but um, why the East India Company, the British East India Company, rather than the Dutch East India Company or the French East India Company was the one that thrived and ultimately dominated. Um, I, I, I'd be interested to hear other thoughts on that, but my, my view is that the British one was more associated, well, it brought together the idea of trading success and military success. The two wings were together, whereas I think in the case of the Dutch and the French, there wasn't this identity of interest. I don't know if you would agree with that. Well, of course, the French, uh, uh, especially at the end, uh, they did play a key role in training. Um, and um, had there not been French treachery in the Battle of Delhi, that might have gone the other way. But um, to what extent, Oliver, do you think um, we had military superiority? Or to what extent didn't we? Because one of the things I should tell the audience is that there are, are wonderful descriptions of battles which military people uh, will delight in, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but was there a, 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 a theme of British military superiority? My view is that the French were probably initially actually better than we were. I think they were the ones that brought um, European skills and um, munitions and equipment uh, to bear. And I think the East India Company uh, probably uh, came second, except perhaps at sea, because we were stronger at sea. Uh, which in the end was critical in beating the French. But it was the French, I think, who were more skilled at um, uh, training um, the local uh, soldiers in their um, ways of how to fight a battle. Um, and they um, were very good uh, in, in, in winning against, as you probably know, they, the French beat the British uh, a military okay. Okay. in southern India um, several times before we got, we the British, uh, got into gear and more organized. Uh, but that's why I say it wasn't relentless, because the, uh, in my view, uh, it could well have been that the French um, could have gone on, except, uh, sadly, um, they ran out of money. Uh, we financed, I think, whether it's through trade or through other means, um, did have more money than the French. It was because of the French lack of money uh, that they wanted to go deeper into the territory and control the taxes and all, uh, but it was we who had more money and, and militarily eventually uh, beat the French, but no, not inevitably. Not inevitably, sir. No. Um, what about uh, this question? One of the things which William makes up very strongly in his book is he's horrified by the idea that it should have been a commercial company uh, which is solely loyal to its shareholders um, who uh, uh, took, a, took power basically in India. To what extent actually was the East India Company uh, merely a commercial company? To what extent was it a political body? To what extent was it responsible 
to the government or controlled by the government? Well, the thing to remember to start with is that it could not be controlled by the British government, uh, although the British government wanted to control it. Uh, they, as you know, brought in uh, acts in 1774 and 1783, the regulatory acts, um, and they were meant to control the activities of the East India Company. But just, you can probably imagine uh, how you control a company that is, it takes a letter six months to get there and six months to reply. <laughs> now, uh, in, in the meantime, one could say, the person on the spot had to make the decisions, and they <laughs> did. And so, as much as the British government wanted to control the East India Company, they were their own um, governors, really, and they got on with it, and they did pretty well. Yes, well, in, in a sense it would be true to say, wouldn't it, that the East India Company failed to control itself? They did, although they, the, the, as I said, Robert Clive did begin to try to reform the behaviour of the company, and so did Warren Hastings. Yes, but uh, uh, equally, of course, it, it's right, isn't it, Walter, that uh, uh, the East India Company wasn't at all amused by the activities of Lord Wellesley and the expansionist policies of Earth Times. That's, yeah, that's very true. Um, the, I mean, but the, there is this interesting um, ambivalence about the relationship of the company and the state. And uh, Willie makes much of it. He treats it as a, a, an independent phenomenon, a corporation, a transnational corporation, um, which really was able to do its own thing and was not controlled. Uh, there was actually quite a lot of attempts at control. I take your point, of course, Oliver, that at a distance it was difficult to do, but I mean, just looking at the legislation, the, uh, first of all, it only had a monopoly for a period of years, so the charter had to be renewed year by year. Uh, and the, I mean, there were as many acts as I just take one run of them, in 1712, 1730, 1742, were all attempts to limit the company's independence, not necessarily for uh, administrative reasons, but in order to secure a larger slice of the company's revenue. But um, the Regulating Act was certainly, that of 1773, was certainly a real attempt to bring the company under some sort of parliamentary control. And after that, you get a, a rash of acts, 1784 Pitts Act, which gave political control to the Crown, so that, as you say, Mark, there was uh, the extension that the company wanted to be able to get it on, on with its own thing and didn't like the fact that uh, military leaders were coming in who had a more or less free hand. But Parliament is flexing its muscles. Uh, you get greater counter control in 1786, the Two More Charters Act and the Government of India Act in 1833, and there's a, there's a difference, there's a different climate now, and I don't think this was brought out very well in the book. In the 18th century, great period of laissez-faire, uh, 1776 was it, Adam Smith wrote the, the, uh, uh, the Wealth of Nations. Yeah, and he refers to this unseen hand, the fact that the economy had a dynamic of its own and it was impossible and not desirable to interfere with it. So when Willie complains that the company was allowed a free reign, he really is forgetting that he, that would have been flying very much against the spirit of the times. And that spirit changed by the end of the 18th century, Parliament's conceiving its role as being much more interventionist Parliament is interfering, uh, well, for a start, Parliament is sitting much more because it's raising taxes to finance the Napoleonic War, and it has to face up to new phenomena, which are the results of the Industrial Revolution, and it interferes with factory acts and commissions and so on, and increasingly uh, says we can't accept this company behaving like a rogue elephant. We've got to bring it more and more under control. So. Uh, I think the, the argument is slightly specious that it was an independent entity. It, 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 was, it was the state in the guise uh, of a company. But the, surely 1813 was critical insofar yeah. as that the, the act in 1813 said 
finally, that the East India Company no longer had a monopoly of trade yep. in India, which is what they set out to do, mm. and they didn't have it after that, so more and more it was clearly the British government yep. uh, that was in control. Now there's this continuing on this theme of the East India Company as a commercial organization for a moment. There is this, what to me is rather strange idea that the East India Company, uh, with all its peculiarities, is actually the model on which modern corporations grew. In other words, uh, uh, you might say that uh, the East India Company was uh, uh, an 18th and 19th century Coca-Cola, or Coca-Cola is a 21st century East India Company. Now, I find that idea very strange. Uh, what, what would you say? Yes, I, I think that that is a bit far-fetched, but I think probably what Woolley is getting at is that the behavior uh, of uh, a company, whether it's the East India Company or any other, is, I think, what they describe as to make money. Um, and that has been criticized and uncontrolled over a number of years. I mean, if you, even if you come up to today, uh, there's a newspaper, the British Financial Times, which you would have think, thought was rather in favor of capitalism, and about a month ago, it had an article saying that um, capitalism was out of control and needed regulation. Well, that's exactly what the acts in 1773 and 1784 were doing. They were trying to control um, uh, uh, people who were trying to make a living uh, from a commercial enterprise. Um, but even the Financial Times said it has to be regulated. And that was what was going on in India to the extent that the government was trying to control the habits, but it might, we can, may go on to say in the 19th century um, whether that went on in an uncontrol... I think it was fairly well controlled and the, the good thing which Willie doesn't get onto because he finishes in 1803 or 1813 mm -hmm. is that uh, the, the, the British companies more and more were um, behaving in conjunction with Indian companies and many, many Indians. It was the Indian financiers, for example, who then were helping the British companies. And it was as much um, the British, uh, sorry, the Indian businessmen who were interested in being capitalistic. Well, what, what do you say about that idea, Walter, that uh, the British the, the, uh, company or uh, corporation today somehow grows out of the East India Company. No, I don't buy that at all. Um, I, I, I think this is... I mean, I, we started by saying this isn't a tremendously new presentation. And I think to be slightly cynical, uh, the USP, the selling point uh, here, is to make the analogy with Walmart and Coca-Cola, who are international companies, but they don't have armies, they don't have navies. Um, in, in some ways, they're affected, they're, they are more insidious because they're not regulable by any one country. Whereas the East India Company was regulable, it may not have been regulated very much, but Parliament could regulate, uh, and one Parliament, one, one, in one country could regulate to control it. Whereas, as we know, Google and so on, uh, because of their tax base and the way they, they are based offshore in, not in tax havens, are not directly controllable by any one company and may not be even controllable by the, all the countries in the world put together. So there's a, the differences. In some ways, the East India Company was uh, more dangerous, in some ways less dangerous, but it wasn't the same thing anyway. Mm. Yeah. If, if, if the mention, I'm, I can't resist. Yes. Um, uh, people, I think, have probably heard of something called Google and something called Microsoft. Yes. Um, one of the advantages of the British period in India, um, in fact, we haven't come across Shashi, or mentioned Shashi Tarua yet, but he admits that there were three advantages. One was the language, one was cricket, and one was tea. Uh, but just to stay with um, the English language, that enabled a lot of... of Indians to go abroad, um, and there are over three million, as you probably know, three million um, um, people are from um, South Asia in England, but also they did very well in business, um, both in England and in America, and if you talk, take 
Google and Microsoft, for example, I'm sure some of you know um, who is the CEO of Google and who is the CEO of Microsoft. What nationality are they? Indians. Indians, thank you very much, yes. And if you go in Britain, for example, um, um, the Financial Times told us a couple of months ago uh, that last year, Indian-owned companies in Britain earned over 48 billion pounds. So they've been doing extremely well. So in one sense, there was somebody, there was a quote by someone you won't have heard of. He's called Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, and Boris Johnson um, said a few, a couple, when he was foreign secretary, uh, he said that Britain now um, benefits from reverse colonialism. Uh, by which he means that there are a number of Indian businessmen who are doing brilliantly uh, for the British economy. They're doing very well. The other thing I love is that the East India Company, as some of you may know, is today, today owned by an Indian, um, which I think is, is wonderful. So there is a great, I, I love the um, connection uh, that the British period in India has given us today in Mark Britain, Dine. where we adore our British, uh, our Indian uh, citizens. And some of you may know, and I'm not sure Could if I you do know I this, in the parliament that Could has I just been the changed, the in that yes, yes. parliament, mm -hmm. there were, in the, what we, the House of Commons, the Lok Sabha, there were 28 people from the Indian subcontinent, 28. In the House of Lords, Thank you, I quite agree. In the House of Lords, there are still, because the election, 36 people are from South Asia. So that's 28 in the House of Commons, 36 in the House of Lords. Sometimes I am naughty and I ask my dear Indian friends, please could they remind me how many MPs are there in the Lok Sabha from Britain? <laughs> if any of you know the answer, please tell me. And also in the Rajya Sabha, how many British people are there? Because in England, 28. Anyway, I, 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 I leave that point with you. <laughs> no, well, you want to say. Well, I, I, I was interested to hear you say, Oliver, uh, quoting um, the book that uh, England had done something useful in leaving the English language and tea and cricket, was it? Cricket, yeah. Yes. Um, but I noticed Shashi Tharoor coming back to him. I knew it would have to come <laughs> to him. <laughs> uh, he says, yeah, we've got these, um, these things, but, and he makes the big but uh, that Willie doesn't make. But these, we didn't come to India in order to give you railways or English language or cricket. We did this for our own benefit. And uh, if they were of benefit to India in the long run, then that's an accidental benefit. And so we don't get any credit for that, uh, according to Shashi. I'm not convinced that that's a fair way of looking at things. I mean, if we're going to be blamed for the bad things we left behind, then don't we get some credit for any few good things we left behind? Uh, are they not benefits because we didn't mean to bring them? Does that some way rule them out of being benefits? I'm I agree. not convinced. I agree, yes. I, well, I there's always this, this question, isn't there, um, Oliver, what, of, of motive and what actually happens. I mean, the classic example is the railways. The railways have been a huge benefit to India. But uh, did we, out of selflessness, uh, build the railways? No, we didn't. But how important is it? I think that, um, as you say, they might have been for our benefit at the time, but they also benefited India a great deal. Uh, Shashi Tharoor mentions those three benefits. Um, I can mention 40 um, um, ben benefits that I could list. I've got a list of them, but I won't go through. But there's a very good book um, by, I think he's a Sikh gentleman, is Kartar Lalvani, um, who wrote a book called The Making of India, um, The Untold Story of British Enterprise. I recommend it a lot. And I read that book from cover to cover, and I came out from that with 40 benefits from the British period in India that today have benefited benefited India. They may have been to our benefit then, but they are undoubtedly of benefit. And there are a number of Indians, I mean, 
um, there was uh, Manmohan Singh um, made some lovely quotes about there being benefits without doubt from the British period. Um, and there's another man called, uh, you've heard of, uh, there's a man called Amartya Sen. Some of you may have heard of him, uh, Professor. He um, uh, wrote, well, he's got the Nobel Prize for Economics. Um, he also, um, he also uh, wrote uh, a, a very good uh, book on the, the British, what the British left uh, in India, which did India a lot of good. Um, he also actually made a comment, however, which I particularly like which is about our friend Robert Clive. Um, he said, uh, Robert Clive, you may know this one. He said, um, Robert Clive, he, he said, if Robert Clive um, um, and the Battle of Plassey had been a game of cricket, um, it was clear that Robert Clive would not be allowed to play cricket again for many years, <laughs> which I thought was a good way of putting it. Um, but so some people have not uh, behaved as well as they should, but that's uh, another story. But there are those 40 ways, including the railways, the irrigation, and uh, many others. But um, we must be careful not to be seen too much as blowing the trumpet for Britain. So um, you would say was some of the uh, disadvantages, some of the damage that we did. Well, I'd like to answer that slightly obliquely by observing something which I took out of the book, which uh, he doesn't really spell out, but it's there if you look for it. And we start in 1600 with England as a very poor agricultural country which has just done something very, very foolish. It has turned its back on Europe. Uh, Brexit in 1600 was the Reformation. It wasn't a political matter, it was a, it was a religious matter. The Church of England and, and, the, and the English nation broke with Rome, broke with Roman Catholicism, and uh, thus became a, a pariah, uh, with, uh, facing always the threat of invasion and warfare from, the, from Catholic Europe. So we have this very poor, relatively poor nation in 1600, which comes to India and takes untold wealth from the country. Uh, the book is quite good on this. I mean, the, the scale of the rape of India is enormous. This money is taken back to Britain and um, Thereafter, to a large extent, the running of India is paid for by the Indians, by the taxes that were raised, so that India paid for its own slavery uh, and continued to export money to Britain. That money um, came to Britain and sparked, funded the Industrial Revolution, the great, that, that great period of industrial activity in which Britain was ahead of any other country in the world, and on the basis of which, and perhaps only on the basis of which, Britain is still uh, a preeminent country in the world. We made, we made things, and we needed money to fund this, and the, the, the seed corn for that investment was the money we took from India. We then exported the things we made and sold them to India. But we also exported them to West Africa. And in West Africa, having dumped the goods that we had made with Indian money, we took aboard slaves, and we carried the slaves to the Caribbean. And the Caribbean, um, from the Caribbean, we brought back tobacco and sugar and various things, some of which were in fact sold to India. So the, the money that started from India funded the Industrial Revolution and the slave trade. And uh, we have nothing much to be proud of in what we did in relation to India, Certainly nothing to be proud of in what we did to the slave trade. And in between what we did do, we created industrial pollution on a scale that is still troubling the world. So in a sense, our Indian adventure uh, was of only short-term benefit to us and of very little benefit to anyone else. Whatever you that were lovely, um, uh, uh, scoring off the what you would say the advantages of what we gave, uh, what would you say about the de damage? The damage done? Yeah. Um, well, um, I, certainly there were some awful periods. 
um, one of which was whether, whether we tried hard enough to make preparations for famines. Uh, as you, you um, I'm sure, know very well, there were um, several disastrous famines and I'm sure we uh, could be criticized uh, for our lack of preparation. And in some cases, I think even worse than that, we um, held back, as I understand it, foodstuffs, which during the, second, the one in the Second World War was a very a good uh, case in point. But that was a, a very bad um, point of, um, uh, of our uh, policy towards India. Would uh, either of you like in to talk a bit about, as, as we're on this subject, of what we left and what was good and what was bad, um, to what, what extent can we, if we, I hesitate to use the word take credit for, but to what extent uh, can India be grateful to Britain for its armed forces? To, uh, I think what it, one of the 40 benefits left by Britain was uh, definitely the army. And it was an apolitical army. I'm, not, I'm never quite sure, and I all, often ask my uh, friends from Pakistan, um, how did India get the lesson right from Britain? But Pakistan, I'm not sure they got the full story. Um, what Pakistan did with their army is obviously very different, but I think India itself um, did benefit very well because they obviously um, respected uh, what had been suggested to them and I think, I hope, you think also that the um, Indian army uh, benefited hugely from that connection. But as I said, I'm not sure that it's in Pakistan it had the same effect. And what, 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 what do you say about the army? Well, one of the great pleasures of being here at this wonderful and very friendly festival has been to meet a lot of Indian officers, um, senior officers and less senior officers. And um, they, I've talked quite a lot about this to them, uh, and I, unless they've just been terribly polite, and I, I know they are terribly polite, um, I think they really do believe that the legacy, the military legacy uh, that we left was useful. Uh, that certainly would be my view like, like yours, Oliver, but I, it's certainly what I'm being told. Um, and I was very pleased to see a, a Scot from the Royal Regiment of Scotland wearing his kilt in the tent earlier on. I'm glad to know that liaison between Scotland and uh, Punjab continues. Um, in some ways, two military mountain races uh, who have a lot in common. But I, I think the, I mean, the Indian Army ha has done extraordinarily well uh, in the years since partition. Uh, and that can't be by accident. It must be something to do with the basis on which it rested when it was formed. Of course, the one thing which I often get uh, um, thrown in my face is that uh, the British left uh, India at the bureaucracy. Um, and uh, the bureaucracy is not always something people are happy about in this country. Well, um, the ICS, I th somebody once said that the British Empire um, left a better legacy in terms of the government and the civil service than many of the others. I mean, uh, France, Portugal, Spain, when they left some of their colonies, there was no administrative structure there at all, whereas the ICS, I think, um, I hope, um, would be agreed was a very good uh, legacy. Um, the details of bureaucracy may be another thing, but the structure of an incorrupt um, senior civil service, I think, is very important. Walter? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a long time since 1947, and if Indian bureaucracy is tiresome, um, repetitive, duplicating, um, and sometimes redundant, then I, I think India's 
courageous enough to accept some responsibility for that. I don't think we can really feel... There are lots of things I feel guilty about in relation to our Indian policy, but if India is hide-burned by bits of paper now, I don't think that's my fault. <laughs> now, I don't know what we're doing about time, but I've got two more questions I'd like to ask, and then we can throw it out into the house. Um, the first one was, the first one is, uh, what do we think we were doing in India, especially towards the end? Um, there is a wonderful book by a historian um, who we were talking about. Tetan Khan. 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 Roy? Khan. Tetan Khan Roy? Khan, the historian. Tetan Khan Roy, was it? No. Uh, the historian who wrote that book about the collapse Neil. of the British Raj. The collapsing rods. Neil, Neil, um, no, no, the Pakistani lady. No, no, not, not me. Really? No. Well, the, the book by this historian, I, I'll, find it, I'll find her name, <coughs> I should know it, uh, which really details how by the time the war came, the Raj was basically collapsing anyhow. And of course, in the war, um, it really, by the end of the war, it read, had effectively collapsed. But if we go back to uh, uh, the, after the First World War, for instance, why did we decide that we needed to continue to be in India um, after the First World War? Well, that's a question I've been thinking about for years, and I'm not really convinced I know. Um, in 1918, we, uh, Britain, uh, increased the size of its empire by about 20% when the Ottoman Empire collapsed and Britain was handed uh, as what were called mandates, but was called Palestine, now Israel, Jordan, or Transjordan it was called then, and what is now called Iraq. So we, we had this huge increase of territory given to us. The Secretary of State for the Colonies at that time was no less than Winston Churchill. And Churchill, whom we regard as a, a reactionary imperialist, wanted nothing more than to get rid of these new territories as quickly as possible. Britain was pretty well bust after the First World War. Military were very stretched. We didn't have the, uh, the military resources or other resources to police these new territories, uh, and they were costing money. And Churchill was very concerned to get rid of them just as fast as he could. Um, and there was a bit of face saving, but they were rushed, these new territories were rushed into arguably premature independence. Britain secured foreign policy controls over them and economic controls so we could get, make the most of that. But in other respects, they were given self-government um, and left to get on with the job very far from being in a position to do so. On the other hand, India, we just wouldn't give up. Um, and Churchill, more than anyone else, the same Churchill, exemplified this desire. Um, in 1940, when he was first Lord of the, uh, first Lord of the Admiralty, not yet Prime Minister, um, he looked at the 1935 Government of India Act and said, we have created a tripos, that's a, a three-legged stool, consisting of the princely states, Muslims and Hindus, created this tripos in which we may, we may sit indefinitely. Why did he want to sit there indefinitely? India was costing us money. We were no longer getting money out of India. Well, he said that if we were without India, we would amount to little more than Belgium. So it was, seemed to be a kind of feather in his cap or the jewel in the crown, but we, we were determined to hang on to it. Um, a realist like Wavell, the second last viceroy, comes out. He's a military man and the military men here will perhaps appreciate his, the way he approached the job. He, first of all, he did some research at the India office in London and he said, we've been telling lies to India for 70 years. We've been promising one thing and doing another. It's a shameful history. Then he comes out, he makes an appraisal of the situation, he assesses the situation and he formulates a plan. And the, his plan, he says, there are two alternatives. We either 
genuinely prepare India for the sort of independence that Macaulay had had in mind in 1834 when an independent India would be indistinguishable from one of the home counties in terms of governance and, um, and its specific nature. We either do that and that'll take us two generations and we haven't ever tried to do it and we can't do it now or we get out pretty fast, two years time, maybe even a fighting retreat north uh, from the south of India. That, to my mind, was a, a very able military man assessing the situation without uh, any preconceptions. And it leads him to a very clear conclusion. But there remained the people like Churchill, not indeed after 1948 at Conservative Party conferences, year after year, there were motions passed deprecating the fact that we had lost India. And so I don't really understand what we wanted to do or what we meant to do in the long run. I don't think we did know. I mean, I, at the risk of sounding a little schmaltzy, I think a lot of people who came to India fell in love with the place. And I, that I can understand, although I've only been here for three or four visits. Um, and they were genuinely sorry to lose close connection with such a wonderful country. But there was more to it than that. And there's a, there's a deep kink in the national psyche. The, the book that um, was mentioned that I'm, I'm working on at the moment about Churchill and India, one of the things I want to look at there is precisely why there was this hang up on the part of not just Churchill, but hundreds of thousands of others, mostly on the right, what it was that made them, from some sort of sentimental reason rather than a practical one, desire to, to retain and control of the subcontinent. If you uh, read Philip Mason's wonderful book, The Men Who Ruled India, uh, you get the impression uh, firmly from him, and he was a dedicated Indian civil service, that right up to the end, virtually, there was also this belief that we were doing something for India because we were bringing it into the modern age, we were preparing it to be a modern nation. And of course this is um, dismissed by many people as condescension. Well, right at the beginning you mentioned Macaulay, um, and as you know, um, Thomas Macaulay in um, 1835 wrote his famous minute on education in which it was recommended and agreed that English should be the medium of education and government. But it, Macaulay, even in the 1830s, said, um, and this was actually recorded by an Indian author, Zaria Masani, who wrote a very good book on Macaulay. Um, Macaulay said that this suggestion, this recommendation of English uh, being the official language, um, may lead to um, a group of people um, wanting to have independence for in He accepted that this may be a conclusion. That's in the 1830s. And he said, and I want to get it right, he said about that, he said, yes, he, it may be uh, that the, this new group of people would contest and replace British rule and that they, the nationalists, might demand um, some European institutions. And Macaulay said about this, I would never attempt to avert or retard this. Whenever it comes, it will be the proudest day in British history. Now that was said in the 1830s about the possibility of India eventually um, seeking their own independence. And I think that was a tribute. It was the people in between that was the problem. Some of them were very liberal, like some of the viceroys. Lord Ripon, for instance, was very liberal. But I agree with you uh, that it was far too slow. We only very grudgingly gave some um, 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 uh, votes and some voice uh, to um, the, the Indian population. Which, but uh, I think the spirit was in the right place. Could I add a personal anecdote to that, Mark? Mm -hmm. um, my wife, who was sitting in the audience patiently listening to me, was conceived in the Nilgiri Hills in India. Uh, her grandfather had, um, was a, came from a poor background he um, worked very hard at school uh, and got a scholarship at school and then a scholarship to Oxford, to Glasgow University and then a scholarship to 
Balliol College, Oxford, and he was very proud of the fact that he, after the age of 12, didn't cost his parents a penny. Um, so from this very poor background, by his own efforts, very considerable efforts, he got into the Indian Civil Service, passed the exams, and came out to India. And he ended up as governor of Bihar and Orissa. Now he, so he was following the footsteps, if you like, of Clive, but he came back to Britain in retirement with rather less means than Clive brought back in the 18th century. And he lived the, as a pensioner, he lived the life, I suppose, of a doctor or a lawyer or the kind of thing he might have been if he had stayed in India, in England, I should say, in Scotland, I should say. Um, his son, after <laughs> impregnating his wife in the Nagiri Hills, decided to go back to uh, England, having been a railway engineer with the Madras Railway. When he went, his father, the now retired governor, said, you mustn't do this. You must stay here. And the reason he was to stay here was not to make money, of course. It was because he felt that the young Indian state needed people to stay on and help it as much as they could. Now, that attitude may have been enormously patronizing. Uh, the idea that in some way we were better able to look after India than India was able to look after itself. But it wasn't a dishonorable view. In fact, it was a very honorable and idealistic view in its way. And I think we have to be very careful when we look back at our time in India to remember that people and their ideas are the product of the times in which we live. And we can be quite sure that in 100 years from now, however perfect we may think we are, our successors will think that we were deeply flawed and tolerated injustices that should never have been tolerated. So I, I would end with a slight plea that we should be gentle to our predecessors in the hope that our successors may be gentle to us. Well said. The last question I have for both of you uh, very, uh, is the old one, uh, but a very important one. What would have happened if... Uh, the anarchy hadn't ended with uh, the British establishing themselves in the way they did. Well, it's possible that um, other uh, countries may have invaded as they had invaded India over the course of many centuries, but it has been written by several scholars uh, that they thought that if India had had um, rulers from France, Portugal, Spain, Holland, Belgium, uh, um, the Ottoman Turks, um, um, the Austro-Hungarians, um, and that they probably would have had a far worse time than under the British, and that in fact empires have um, um, prevailed throughout history, and um, one, um, in fact, an in Deepak Lal um, wrote a book called in, in Defense of Empire, and his conclusion was um, that the British Empire uh, was far shorter and more benign uh, than most other empires before them. And so I think in a way um, it's possible uh, that foreign other countries uh, would have left uh, India um, in, in, a, in a not such a good um, position. But what about if India had been left by foreign countries uh, uh, to rule itself? Um, what would have happened, do you think? I presume the best chance would be the Marathas. Uh, the Marathas were the most powerful, um, the, the last people, well, not the last people to be um, 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 uh, conquered by the, the British, uh, but they were a huge group. Uh, of course, the, the Sikhs uh, were there also, um, but those internally, I think probably the Marathas had the best chance in terms of, of the scale of their um, leadership. And what about you, Walter? What do you think would have happened? Well, um, Shashi Tharoor says that if we hadn't come in at that time, native Indian wit, uh, entrepreneurism, ability would have filled the gap. And he, he may be right, and I'm the last one to claim benefits f for Britain. It's rather awkward that three of us are uh, sitting here with uh, representing the 
appearing to represent the British side. He may be right. Um, maybe India would have filled the gap itself. I think from a um, from the point of view of, a, of, the, of the need for extensive trading links, that would have been difficult. And I would just ask to consider what happened to China throughout that 18th century. Um, so I, I think what I'm saying rather reluctantly is that we were probably uh, quite a good thing, although probably for the bad reasons. <laughs> Well, no, I, I think we can throw it open if anyone um, wants that. Uh, yes, just. Mm. I can't resist. Um, the, uh, some of you may or may not know this, um, but uh, <laughs> in the outgoing British government, I mentioned the number of MPs, but you, um, the British cabinet uh, before this election um, had four. Um, um, four of its members of the cabinet were from South Asia. Uh, including the second most senior, uh, who is the finance minister, what we call the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, he's called Sajid De Javid. But what I th you may not have seen is the Conservative Party uh, has an annual conference. And this year, this was a couple of months ago in October, it was in Manchester. And the um, finance minister, the Chancellor, number two in the government, Sajid De Javid uh, from South Asia, stood up and he spoke and his speech began in a language called Punjabi. <laughs> and, and he said in Punjabi, and he addressed his remarks to his mother, who was sitting in the front row. And I'm afraid I'm going to give you a translation of his first remark. It said, Mum, did you ever think we'd be here? Do you remember Dad's first shop used to be just down the road? In other words, this um, a man from India was, he is now our finance minister and his father, and he, he went on to say in English, 20 years ago, mum thought it was a big deal when she watched the first Asians move into Coronation Street. Coronation, Coronation Street is um, a, a very popular British television show you may have seen. Now, and I'm quoting again, now she, his mother, watched the first Asians move into Downing Street. <laughs> Downing Street, as you probably know, is where the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, the Finance Minister, work and live. So here we have an Indian uh, next to the Prime Minister in Downing Street. Once again, she, this was him, uh, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister from India, saying once again, uh, we're living above the shop. Um, and I'm ha so happy it makes mum so proud. <laughs> I think that is brilliant. And Robert yeah. Clive, as you may remember, mm -hmm. in 1765, was made finance minister of Bengal. Of the two, I would prefer to go on holiday with Sajid Javid. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Now, do we have any questions? Do yes, questions? Yeah. Do we have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, what, right can you hear me? Working. Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah? Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, uh, what are your thoughts on the East India Company? You have mentioned uh, a very capitalistic system uh, and um, also to a certain extent consumerist because of such high production levels, there has to be some demand which is also created to consume the products which were being made in mass uh, production systems in the industrial economies. So what do you think is the effect of those capitalist and consumerist systems on Indian subsistence, agriculture and indigenous industries and uh, artisans? Like any thoughts or comments? Did you understand? I, my, my view is that Indian businessmen are far better than British businessmen. Um, I'm not sure that we trained you. I think you're just better at it naturally. Uh, but um, I think it's undeniable that um, uh, Indian businessmen uh, did extremely well, both in India and now in Britain um, and elsewhere in the world, I've already mentioned. Uh, so I hope uh, that it's the case that although some of the things we did, I'm not an economist, 
um, were unfortunate. I think the result today is that you, uh, Indian, and your businessmen are brilliant, and I hope we can claim a little credit, but I actually think you were very good at it in the first place. <laughs> I couldn't improve on that. That was, uh, I think, a very good <laughs> summary. There we are. Now, any more questions? Yes. The governor. My question is very simple. We are in Punjab, we are in the military literature fest. Punjab has contributed so much, and India as well, in the First and the Second World War. Human resources, otherwise, and that has not been touched here. And the, the new thinking is, even in England, that if India, Punjab had not contributed, the Allied forces would have seen a different war. It could have been that the First and the Second World War would have taken a different turn. Here, my question exactly is, after all this, Colonel Dyer, immediately after the First World War, puts up and fires at an agitation who had no weapons in Jallianwala Park. What do you have to say on that? Well, if I could just say something very briefly about this. First of all, um, I, I think uh, that uh, in Britain, uh, we are very much keeping alive the memory of the soldiers from Punjab and elsewhere in India who lay down these lives and it is very widely known that those figures in both wars run in to the millions um, and that uh, certainly in the east uh, and in other theatres as well but in the second uh, world war in the east General uh, Field Marshal Slim more than once referred to the fact that he felt his Indian troops were better trained, better soldiers than um, the British troops. Um, and so I do think this memory is being preserved and, and I think we certainly um, should preserve it. As for Jolly and Wallabag, you've had a whole session on that. Um, I'm not really, uh, these two are meant to be speaking, they can speak in a minute. But very quickly, um, that was uh, an absolutely shocking a deplorable incident. Um, it was also an incident, if you read the details of it, which illustrated how fragile the, the Raj was, because one of the main reasons why um, there was so much fear in Amritsar at that time was because the situation was so out of control, <coughs> sorry, so out of control in Punjab that the British in Punjab feared the Indian war, Indian mutiny as they knew it, um, was, going to, was starting again. Um, so, yes, uh, it was a deplorable thing. There were, there were some historical reasons why it happened, but nothing can uh, forgive it. And as, as many of you will know, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, was the last Brit British dignitary who's come and he laid uh, f on his stomach uh, and expressed his deep regret on behalf of the Church of England. So, uh, would you like to say something, Oliver, as well? Um, no, I totally agree with Mark, absolutely, yeah. Yes, I totally agree with Sir Mark on that. Um, we talked quite a lot this morning about Jalian Wallabak. Um, and I don't think I can add anything to what Samarka said there. Um, I think there is a greater awareness now than there ever has been about the contribution of Indian troops, actually, in both wars. Um, I've written about both of them, and I'm very well aware of the crucial um, role that India played. Um, the, I think the outcome of the Second World War would have been very, very different. Uh, particularly in, the, in relation to the war in the, in the East. 
First World War, I, I think people have, are very moved and increasingly moved by images that are frequently shown of Indian soldiers on the Western Front fighting in the snow uh, in terrible conditions for a country of which some of them would know very little. Uh, and I don't know how much uh, choice they had in coming. I think they had no choice in coming to be there. In, re in relation to the war in, the, in Mesopotamia, the Indian, it was the Indian Army that fought there. We are only just, I think, waking up to the importance of the campaign there, um, a campaign which put us in a much stronger position after the First World War than we'd otherwise have been. And um, I think it, it is disgraceful and deploring, deplorable that uh, the Indian contribution wasn't properly marked there. There's a monument in Basra which records the deaths of those who fought in that theater. Now, the, the Imperial War Commission, Imperial War Graves Commission, which was set up in the course of the war to deal with the graves of those who had fallen in the war, decided at a very early point that all ranks should be displayed equally. The officers and men are buried side by side without any distinction. Their names and their regiments and possibly some biographical details are shown on the headstones. Um, where the names couldn't be ascertained, as in the Western Front, there's a great memorial at Tietfal, where the names of those who died in that theatre but whose bodies were never found are recorded. At Basra, they didn't carry out the same protocol. The names of the English officers and English ever rank, other ranks who died in that theatre are shown. The names of the Indian officers are shown. The names of the hundreds of thousands of Indian other ranks who, uh, who died are not shown. Uh, the number, just the sheer stark awful number appears and that indignity perpetrated on these men in death is something of which we are profoundly uh, ashamed. Now, um, one more question and then we have to stop. So, uh, my name is Devin. So, I disagree uh, and I want your opinion. I disagree when you said that uh, India was in better hand when it, it, when it was in British because India would be better if it would be in the hand of India. Because, first of all, Punjabis and Rajput had a lot of battles and Punjab uh, has uh, many invasions came in, uh, in India through Punjab. So, after so many years, uh, if we, uh, today also in the military, the Punjabis are very strong. They are mostly Punjabis and what British came and did here was the lowest ranks uh, what the lowest ramps were given to Indians and on top of that the uh, the highest that uh, the the highest that an Indian officer could go had the salary of the person that was newly recruited that was a British person and secondly Bengal was a very intelligent intellectual uh, uh, state and which was then again divided by the Britishers because they thought that Chennai was a nerve center. And uh, what else I would like to say was, when you said that, uh, Brit when you said that the Brit you don't know that after World War I, why did, British, uh, why did British want to still hang on to India? Uh, many countries were in economic crisis. And uh, our market had lots of taxes when our shipment went to British and there were high taxes. However, when British shipment came to India, there were not many taxes on them. So you have a big market when you came to India. On can, top of that... Can you show, c cut yeah, it short? Sorry. Uh, on top of that, we were forced to uh, grow indigo, which reduced the fertility of our land. And if we weren't doing the same, our lands were uh, being... Our lands were... Uh, we, we were... Uh, the Indian people were brutally hurted and uh, I think that, uh, is that okay yeah it's that it's I wish I was I want that the and on the opposite so last thing it's just the last thing uh, okay. so the fact that the British people that I've talked to and the British people that I've met 
Do not know most. Okay, okay, okay. I, I think that's. <laughs> what would you like to say anything about? Walter, what would you like to say? Well, you've raised so many valuable and intelligent questions that I, I don't think I could really answer you without taking a half hour to do so. All I will say is that having heard you already, it was you this morning, wasn't it, that spoke? Yes. Having heard you this morning and heard you this afternoon, I think when India has such articulate, intelligent and well-informed young people, the future has got to be very good for India. <laughs> Yes, well, it's been a great privilege for all three of us to be here with you. Uh, and uh, thank you all very much. And I heartily endorse uh, of uh, last words. So thank you all very much. And particular privilege to have the governor here with us as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have been honored to listen to um, Mark Telly. Uh, it's just such a privilege to have him on stage with us. We are running short of time for the next panel, and I'll quickly invite everybody. Um, the next panel is uh, Imphal, the last battle of the Japanese Empire. And uh, I request everyone to quickly settle down
Hey, Lyman, how are you? Yes, I...
Ladies and gentlemen, may I request you to settle down, please? We are already running short of time. I would really request everybody to settle down. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to begin with the next uh, session. Imphal, the last battle of the Japanese Empire. Major General A.P. Singh is moderating this panel. We have Colonel Dr. Robert Lyman, Aramban Agama Singh, Pushpinder Singh Ji, and we have Brigadier Alan Mallison. Uh, over to you, sir. So, so would you like to settle down? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do settle down. Could I request those people standing to please settle down? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we are here in this panel to talk of the Battle of Imphal. Uh, at the same very place, we discussed the Battle of Kohima yesterday. And uh, during, the, during the Second World War, it is said that the twin battles of Imphal and Kohima were the turning point that changed the course of the Burma campaign. With me on this panel is Robert Lyman. I think he's become a familiar figure in all these panel discussions as of now. Brigadier Alan Warren, 
ብርግዴ አልን ማልንስን አረምባም አረምባም አንጋም ሆዝ ሆዝ ጎን ቱ ጊቭ አስ ዘ ጃፓኒዝ አታክ ፕላን ኤንድ ሂ ኢዝ ዘ ማን ኢን ማኒፑር ሁ ኮንዳክትስ ዘ ባትል ፊልድ ቱዋዝ ኤንድ ፑሽፒንዶ ቾፕራ ሁ ኢዝ ጎን ቱ ስፒክ አቦት ዘ ኤር ዋርፌር ኤንድ ኤር ካምፔን as the esteemed editor and uh, publisher of the Bayou magazine uh, i'd like to give a small brief on how and why the war came to imphal in the first place as you all know the battle of imphal is now seen and recorded as in the world as one of the greatest battles of world war 2 and that is a lot to the efforts of rob lyman here who struggled very hard to get this battle recognized and get as much recognition as those on the african front and in europe Battle of Imphal and Kohima are important to us as Indians because it is with these battles that World War II came to India. Otherwise, for every other Indian, World War II was some war happening either in Africa or in the Far East or on the shores or in, in Europe. The Burma campaign and the exploits of the 14th Army were not well known and not appreciated by people in India. But also for the defeat that the British Army faced in 1942 and earned the sobriquet the forgotten army this 1500 km retreat over a period of 4 months is the long it's the longest retreat in british military history and so it was not for all the good reasons that people would remember the burma campaign up to may 1943 the twin battles of kohima and imphal witness some of the most bitter bitterest fighting on indian soil and for the first time people of india the people of manipur the people of assam were involved in world war 2 but most of all it was mostly an indian affair at the end of world war 2 the largest army fielded by the uk was the 14th army and it consisted of 58% indians 21% west africans and 17% british so it still was the, an army which had the lar- largest indian participation in it on the other side of this battle was the japanese 15th army and the british 14th army facing the japanese 15th army had already suffered a big defeat on their hands It is only after the battle of Imphal and Kohima that the advance of the Japanese was not only halted but also reversed and finally they were ejected and thrown out of Burma. Fortunately in 1942 the monsoon stopped the Japanese from crossing the Chinwind River and they succeeded in their main objective of cutting off the main road which was su- supplying the Chinese because that was most important to them. two things actually then came in to precipitate the battle of imphal and one of them is what we just spoke in the last panel was operation long cloth operation long cloth was the one of the first of uh, was the first chindits operation which we uh, colloquially known as and it somehow uh, shook up the japanese because the long range penetration brigades got behind japanese lines and played havoc with them but also it was great news to the british army in india as this was one of the first few defeats that the japanese had suffered in coming through with operation long cloth it also did a negative thing for the indian army of of convincing the japanese commander that is mutaguchi that if the indians can go across jungles and fight across them until that time they thought that the jungles of burma and the border jungles of uh, the border between burma and india were impenetrable when he realized it the chindits could get across and trouble them he always uh, advocated that even larger forces of japanese could go across and trouble india the second point was imphal was the base from where operation long cloth and the chindits operated and if that base could be shut down and if imphal could be closed then any attack by the british army onto burma or onto the japanese could have been stopped so initially and i'd ask rob to handle this a little later it was only planned to take over imphal and probably kohima but then mutaguchi had other plans and like somebody said he had two different plans so we'll come on to that later but the first thing was why why imphal and why central assam and why didn't the why did the japanese step across 
first thing was they wanted to isolate China, second was closing the leader road, and the most important was Mutaguchi from being a divisional commander suddenly rose to be an army commander and started believing in his ability, not much but definitely aided by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's idea of a great march to Delhi where he spoke to the Japanese and convinced them that once you reach Imphal and enter the Brahmaputra Valley, uh, the in INA would be able to turn the Indians against the British Raj and there was great animosity in India against the British Raj and that could be turned. And that is why uh, Imphal happened. I'd like to just take stage now. And explain to you as to the strategic situation that obtained before the Battle of Imphal took place. There were mounting shipping losses in the Pacific. The Japanese needed something as a morale booster, something to show the empire because they were losing badly in the Pacific. They also had the twin aim, like I just spoke, of beating the British. So the stage was thus set for one of the greatest battles of World War II and probably one of the most remembered battles, that is the battles of Kohima and Imphal that took place in 1944. This is Imphal for you on a Google image. If you pay attention to the roads that are coming in to Imphal from various directions, they remind you of the spokes of a wheel. And Slim describes this uses this analogy of spokes of a wheel with Imphal being the hub and the various roads coming in from Kohima, from Ukhrul, from Tidim, from, uh, from Tamu, Palel Tamu, from Tidim and Bishanpur Silchar as the spokes that came in onto Imphal. And the battle is best described as you take each action going along each spoke. And I think we'll progress this discussion along the spokes of this wheel. But first, what was Imphal? Imphal was a large oasis in the middle of a large amount of mountains. It was a 60 by 40 valley, 600 square kilometers, and was purely an administrative camp. 60 to 70,000 British laborers occupied that, uh, British and Indian labor and troops occupied those camps. It was not laid out at all for defense. They were just cited for administrative significance as administrative camps all over this Imphal plain. It was, in, to both ends, a natural staging house. If the British wanted to enter Burma, they had to use Imphal. If the Japanese wanted to win through and march on to Delhi, they needed Imphal as the staging area. So therefore, Imphal was the natural staging area selected by both sides, and hence the interest by both parties. But one great military weakness was there on the British side. The roads leading to Imphal, that the roads coming north-south, were parallel to the front that they had with the Japanese and so close to the front that they could have been attacked any time by the Japanese. This is a classic military weakness of not having your lines of communication close to your front. But there was nothing that geography could do and they, there was nothing that they could do to change geography at that stage. This was then the lineup before the battle. The Japanese 15th Army with three divisions, the 15th, 31st and 33rd, 
The Indian National Army Division, of which I'll give you a small write-up, was a small division with just 6,000 troops, consisting of the Azad Brigade, the Gandhi Brigade, and the Subhash Brigade. A little more on this when I cover my part of the battle. They had one tank regiment. The British 14th Army had with it four corps, which was basically looking after this area, had 17 Indian Division, the oldest Indian Division which had fought throughout the retreat on its way back, commanded by General Panch Kovan, who was probably the most experienced divisional commander in the whole of the Burma campaign. 20 Indian Infantry Division, 23 Infantry Division, 50 Independent Para Brigade which came in, two 54 Tank Brigades, and two divisions which came in later, five division, Fireball, Fireball Division, and another one which came in at later stages of the battle. But this was what, ha what took place in Imphal. Much later, the campaign was extended to reach back into Burma, to re-enter Burma, reconquer Burma, and that's when more divisions came in and 255 Tank Brigade came in. At this time, Slim started gathering his intelligence and wanted to figure out what the enemy was doing. And it was very clear that the offensive by the Japanese was imminent in the February of 1944. Three Japanese divisions had been identified, like we'd said, and they generally appreciated that the move was to come and capture Imphal and probably go through to the Brahmaputra Valley to cut off the northern leader road. Uh, it was also estimated that both 17 division and 23 division facing the front would be cut off by the Japanese in their typical encirclement tactics and therefore the, he had placed one division in Imphal at the hub of the spokes of, uh, at the hub of that wheel to defend Imphal. He expected two divisions across the Chidwin River at Homalin and Tongdat and head for Imphal via Ukrul. So, technically, all the spokes of the wheel were to be addressed by the Japanese. The decision dilemma with Slim at that stage, and this is written off very, uh, very in great detail in his book, Defeat into Victory, is where he said that my deployment was with an offensive mindset. I was not prepared to defend Imphal. And therefore, he had one division on the Tamu Palel axis, he had one division on the Tidim axis, and he had one division in reserve ready to launch into Burma, least expecting an attack coming from that side, and therefore, he had three options with him. One was attack before the Japanese attacked. It was fraught with risk. He was still fully not prepared as the logistics was not ready. And the second option was to hold the enemy at Chinwind River. But yet again, he was not prepared because he was not ready for a defensive battle. The third was pull back his troops, concentrate all of four corps back into Imphal, fall back into Imphal, make the Japanese reach out, de destroy them in detail once they had extended their lines of communication. This, not a very glamorous option, but was the option chosen by General Slim and in its execution and how the op Japanese um, executed Operation Yugo, which they called their, their attack, is what this panel will discuss now. I'll first go on to uh, Rambam to talk to us about Operation Yugo as the operation was named. A very good afternoon to all of you. On the onset, I would like to thank the organizer okay. for the invitation. Uh, it's been a pleasure here and an honor to be here attending a military literature festival. Uh, well, uh, this is a small slide, and with the amount of time that we have on hand, it is an injustice. So I will start with a Japanese saying that today's enemy is tomorrow's friend, and indeed we are friends now. And my interest here today is a Japanese uh, perspective of the Ugo campaign or the Imparu suction or the Imphal operation. Well, indeed, it's one of the most reckless military operations that Japan has seen so far in the World War II. And I want to start uh, a brief about the battle. And for those of you who still is clueless about Imphal, it is the capital city of the Manipur state in the easternmost corner of India, neighboring Myanmar. And it became the battleground for two antagonists of the world in 1944. Uh, now, before I go with the battle, let me just 
I'll give you a brief about the Japanese soldier and a typical Japanese soldier is a product of rigorous training and extreme fanaticism based around spiritual foundation. He believes in the theory of reincarnation of ancient samurai. And so the only outcome expected of him is either glorious victory or an honorable death, the Bushido's way. Uh, they're mostly drawn from hard agricultural farmland stock and also from factory workers molded along the line to believe in divine emperor, frugal living, and devotion to duty. These very beliefs are to compensate the lack in equipment or technology. Uh, this is just some slides about the training. I'll just go run through it. And this is about the Ugo campaign or the infall section, which was the dream child of Lieutenant General Renya Mutaguchi, who was the commander of 15th Army. Uh, well, he was a very, very successful military campaigner, and he had high reach in the upper echelon of the Japanese military circle, so his ideas were never silenced. And, of course, nevertheless, it took four months to argue with General Kawabe, the commander of Burma Area Army, to come to the point of really launching your divisions. And this headquarters were based in Meimyo, or the present-day Pyonlin in Myanmar. So this is a typical map, a Japanese map, which shows you the infall in the center and Kohima in the north, with the river Chenwen on the right side. And from here, the Japanese would launch into three axes to isolate infall and, of course, to bulldoze Kohima. And the battle would last from 15 March to 9 July till the official order from Mutaguchi for the retreat back to Chinwin. And this is a typical map of the, the axis where the Japanese advanced into Imphal. You have the third side. You have the 31st Division cutting across from the northeastern thrust. And then you have the 15th Division launched just 30 miles down from Homelin on the Chinwin River to cut across Sangshak and to cut the only lifeline that we had, which was the Imphal Kohima Highway. Then you had the 33 Division, which was the most elite group. Uh, they had a tank regiment as well, and they were supposed to capture Imphal by April 28, which was the Emperor's birthday. So I'm moving on. So as as so the FEA said earlier that the Japanese had uh, in a few objectives of launching the Yugo. The, the first and foremost was a preemptive strike before the Allied actually moving into Burma to clear them out. And rest was the same that Sir has already explained again. And so uh, this is the typical terrain that we have there. And if you, and on the foreground, this is the mountain across to Myanmar. And this is the kind of terrain that you're going to fight for the next three months. And it is a vast track of you know, uh, harsh jungles with all the uh, tropical diseases all around. OK, I'll just take a quick run. This is the 31st Division with three axes. OK, this is, this is the right column. They launched from the place called Tamanti on the Chinwin River by March 15. Then this is the central column, which is launched from a place called Kawa on the Chinwin River bank across to Sangshak and then to Imphal. And then you have this, uh, the left column, which is Miyajaki's Thai, which is launched from Homelin on across. And the typical picture of Chinwin River, which I was lucky enough to visit last July. And this is the 31st Division led by Lieutenant General Kotoku Sato, who is, who is considered one of, the, one of the most revered general of all time. And you have the picture of uh, Miyazaki as well here. Then this is the three columns that 
31st division consists of Okay, before, before, before they began the Yugo campaign, there was already intels coming in from the V-Force and the G-Force from all across the borders, and there were still patrol clashes with the Frontier Force and the V-Force. And the actual re reporting came by 5th in March, 1944, but, I mean, nobody's sure where the, where the actual report went. So, but the British never knew that the, or thought that the Japanese would come across these mountains, which was considered impassable at all points. And this is the course of the battle. We'll just run through it. Some of the pictures from the Chivin Crossing by 31st Division. And this is a Southern Trust from the 33th Division, which is one of the most elite group. And their court name was the White Tiger. So the battle here along this axis was called the Battle of White Tiger, Black Cat, the Indian 17th Division, and the Springing Tiger, which was the Indian National Army. And this was one of the most strategic battles that were fought along this route. And it's believed that if the British had lost here, they would have captured Imphal. And this is the general who led the 33th Division, General Yanagida, who was replaced by Tanaka in the course of time. And then this is Colonel Sasahara, who is commander of 215 Infantry Regiment. Then we have the three columns, left, center, right. And the typical picture of uh, the Tedim Road now, uh, this was taken just a few weeks back. And right across you can see the Tonjang and the Kennedy Peak. And this is the course of the battle for 33 Division. I think we and this is 5th and Division who crossed the Chinwin River just about 30 miles down from Homolin at a place called Thangot. And they were one of the most weakest group here. And they were supposed to cut the Imphal Kohima Highway at Kangpokpi, which they did so. And it was commanded by Lieutenant General Masafumi Yamauchi. But he was down with tuberculosis and he died in Mamio in one of Yashin Bioin. And this is the three columns, and the, the progress of the battle again for Putin Dev. Then we have another group called the Yamamoto Force who was coming up across the Mori Imphal axis. Uh, it was the shortest route to Imphal. And, 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 the, and the best part of this uh, battle at around Technopol that is that all the features have typical Mediterranean names. Uh, for example, you have this Gibraltar, Malta, Skagi, Clear East, West, Lentil, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really funny to have those names here. And that's the typical pictures of the access to Imphal at the moment. And if you see on the right, there's a bridge which was built by the Terry Gerwald Field Company back in 1942, and we are still using this bridge at the moment. Okay. And the conclusion is that Imphal battle or the Imphal suction became the largest land defeat for the Imperial Japanese Army. It resulted in around 60,000 casualties, direct or indirect, following the battle. In spite of the gallant rear guard action, they couldn't hold the overwhelming British for long, finally surrendering in Burma. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Rambam. That was the Japanese plan. And like we all in the Armed Forces know no plan survives contact, neither did this one. Uh, but before we go to Rob about his reactions and how the battle progressed further, I'd like to request Brigadier Balanson to give us a few words on what was the situation and what other things were happening around uh, this battle or in the, in the areas of, uh, um, in the rest of the world and also what was the thinking at uh, Imperial General Headquarters in Japan as also what was uh, Command General uh, staff thinking of in, in, in England uh, and what was the primary focus at that time? Was there something else happening in Europe that distracted attention and why was 14th Army not given so much of importance? Those are big questions, um, which before I address, would like to make the same point that I've made in the two previous sessions that I've been in, just in case there's someone here who, who didn't hear it, and that is to say, it's wonderful to be here, and thank you for um, inviting such a strong uh, British presence to your festival. Um, 
I wrote a book called The Making of the British Army, which is about what things in its history really shaped um, the present British Army in terms of its thinking, its ethos, uh, the way it does things, how it organizes and what have you. And um, it's not just a catalog of, of history because um, some things are important in history, some things aren't. They don't really change the price of fish. Um, but I found really the biggest influence on, in many ways, on the shaping of the British Army of today uh, was India, both India the, the place, because so many uh, British troops served in India throughout the 19th century, uh, right up to um, uh, independence, and this inevitably shaped the way um, the army at home uh, thought, because it was a rotation, um, and most senior officers in the British Army, certainly in the Second World War, had served in India uh, at, at some time, all the great names. And the other side, of course, is the Indian Army itself, uh, alongside which um, the British Army, British soldiers, uh, had fought throughout the 19th century and in the First World War, in all theatres, in France, in the trenches, in the Middle East, and of course in the Second World War, and you can't share that amount of fighting uh, without giving and taking uh, from each other best practice. And um, that, I think, is our unique shared military heritage. I say unique, it, it is, there's no other two nations in the world that has such a profound shared military heritage military experience as, uh, as Britain uh, and India. It's, it's a simple house, and therefore the Japanese mentality really at this stage was going on to the strategic defensive uh, uh, until they thought of something that could halt this, this otherwise unstoppable steamroller of, of, of the US Army, the US Marines and the US Navy uh, and their air forces across the Pacific, island by island by island, slowly approaching uh, the Japanese islands. So strategic defensive. So this was, as has been said already, um, something of, a, of an experimental gamble, if you like, to try to uh, weaken uh, this, this British Indian flank. But from the point of view of London, the point of view of the strategic direction of, of the war as a whole, um, what was happening at Imphal and Kohima uh, when the Japanese offensive began was really, um, uh, well, it was hardly, I, I won't say hardly noticed. It certainly was, of course, in, in the war office, the, the reports coming back. Uh, the, the offensive had been expected, strategic intelligence had said that there would be a, a, an offensive, but in, in detail uh, that there was very little. Um, so it didn't come as a surprise, but it didn't come as a worry to London because it believed uh, that any Japanese offensive uh, would either um, fizzle out of its own accord because there, it didn't have the strength to go on, um, uh, and in any case there was confidence in um, the 14th Army, uh, that they could deal um, with any offensive. After all, uh, the, um, the Indian divisions um, had, had very much healed themselves uh, with the help of uh, Field Marshal Slim, as we've heard in the previous session, those of you who were there, and, and by, the, own, by the, the internal strength uh, of the regiments composing these, uh, the, these divisions. Uh, so there was confidence in the Indian army. Um, there was also confidence because we had sent out, uh, the British had sent out um, regular reinforcements in the shape of the uh, 2nd Infantry Division, um, which went to um, Kohima. And this was um, a wholly regular division. There were only one or two um, wartime embodied territorial army regiments in it. This was a, an experienced fighting division uh, from France in 1940. So, and even in the Indian divisions, th there were a, a, a number of regular British units. So, 
the perspective from London was really that this was perfectly containable uh, and, and, and no great problem. So much so, as I said yesterday in the talk on, on Kohima, um, General Sir Alan Brooke, who was Chief of the Imperial General Staff, head of the British Army, but also Chairman of the Joint, um, uh, Chairman of the Joint um, Chiefs of Staff Committee, and therefore, in effect, um, Prime Minister Winston Churchill's strategic advisor. He kept a very detailed wartime diary, which um, included uh, all his thoughts and his concerns, uh, what he did uh, and what he intended to do in great detail. Over the period of the battles at Kohima and Imphal, he does not mention once what's going on. It clearly did not worry the Chiefs of Staff enough to talk about it because he recorded in his diary what the Chiefs of Staff meetings each day uh, discussed and what their concerns and decisions were. And it clearly didn't worry him enough to confide in his diary of, of concerns. And it's only in the middle of July, at the end of a long entry of what he did that day, including a long and very difficult Chief of Staff Committee meeting where they discussed the, the, um, the situation in France after the invasion, which had taken place in, on the 6th of June of Normandy, uh, when things had seemed to stall. Um, it was only then, at the end of that long discussion on uh, what to do, and it had obviously been very fractious with arguments with the Air Force and what have, whatever. He just writes a one-liner saying, but at least the road between Kohima and Imphal is open again, uh, exclamation mark, as, as if it were just a, you know, something to cheer him up and it was to be expected. Um, so from the point of view of London, it wasn't, it wasn't a worry, but perhaps, perhaps it was a disguised worry because, of course, what during this period, uh, from the opening of the battles of Imphal and Kohima, was really going on in the minds of London was the anxiety about the coming invasion of, of Normandy, Normandy, the mounting uh, of that operation, the, the maintenance of deception, um, so that on the 6th of June, when the landings went in, um, the, the Germans were not ready and waiting for them uh, in, in the way that they might have been if they'd known for certain what the target was. And I think, therefore, um, when we talk about the 14th Army being a forgotten army, it was, it was perhaps um, at the back of the mind, if not entirely uh, forgotten. But um, it, did, it did, I would suggest, have a few uh, knock-on uh, advantages, which um, perhaps we'll talk about later on in discussion. Yes. Thanks. Uh, that was exactly the point we were trying to get out. Everybody was focused on the landings at Normandy and an invasion of Europe. That uh, what was happening in Burma was, uh, was, was not taken seriously. And uh, Rob, uh, uh, he's told us about what Hugo launched into us. Could we go through the battle now very briefly along the spokes as you discussed? Certainly. And it's a great pleasure to be back here amongst you all to talk about um, the Battle of Imphal, and we've had the Japanese plans explained to us. Uh, as every soldier knows, of course, as von Moltke told us, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy, and that was exactly the case for the Japanese in 1944. And uh, I'm going to just describe the course of the battle for you from the Japanese plans on the screen, and I'll, I'll point out uh, the, 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 the general course of the battle. It ran from the 7th of March through to August. I'm not going to uh, go through the whole of the battle this afternoon. You'll be very pleased to hear. I'll just give you the key points, the key highlights that relate to the start of the battle because it's fundamental to understanding how the battle itself took place and why the Japanese actually did what they did and why they suffered in the way they did. Uh, it's an extraordinary battle, and as um, AP described at the beginning, General Slim described the battle as the spokes of a wheel, and we had the southern spoke coming up from Tidim, which is uh, down here. The Japanese would cross the, uh, the Chindwin and the Manipur River up to Tidim, where the 17th 
Black Cat Indian Division was based, it had two brigades, two quite uh, lightly equipped brigades of Gurkhas under the command of General Punch Cowan. And Punch Cowan, of course, had commanded that division all the way since the disaster at the Sitang Bridge in 1942. Um, now, there are a couple of very important things that we just need to bear in mind before we start thinking about Imphal. Remember, uh, AP said that there were two plans. And there were two plans. There was an official plan by the Japanese army, signed off by General Tojo in Tokyo. Fascinating story, but you'll have to read about that and not hear it from me on the stage. Which was to do precisely what um, has been described to you, which is to capture Imphal and prevent Imphal from being the launching pad for an offensive into Burma. But Mutaguchi Renya had a grander plan. He had listened to Subhas Chandra Bose and he, he, he agreed that there was an opportunity perhaps to even topple the Raj by carrying on beyond Kahima, which is the little mountain village right at the top up here, there we are, up here, across the mountain another 46 miles down into the Brahmaputra Valley to the massive supply depot and railway nexus at Dimapur. Because Mutaguchi had decided in his mind, and I think he was right, that if Dimapur was captured, the Raj might fall. Certainly the British could never reinforce Imphal again. The Americans operating in the north out of Lido wouldn't be able to be, be supplied. And it was a significant strategic decision, but of course, Mutaguchi had never been given permission to undertake that operation. So that's what you just need to understand. And then as we go through the battle, there are three dates that you need to bear in mind. The first is the seventh, then the 14th, and then the 17th. Let's do four dates and include the 30th. So this is March 1944. The 7th of March 1944, the Japanese 33rd Division under General Yanagida, with two regiments, crossed the Chindwind, moved south through the jungled hills, the Chin Hills of Tidim, crossed the Manipur River, all the while being reported on by Gurkha patrols from the 17th Division, and started to move up against Tidham itself. Now, the British plan was not to fight a battle at Tidham. The British plan was to take the whole of the 17th Division and remove it all the way back up to Bishampur on the southern, uh, southern valley of Imphal because General Schoons, who commanded the 4th Corps, and Slim both agreed that there would be no way that they would be able to support the 17th Division if it was to fight on its own in Tidham. The real problem here, and there's a whole debate about this that we can't go into today, was did the 17th Division withdraw in time? The truth is that the division was prepared to withdraw on about the 8th of March. Uh, as the days went by, it became more disconcerting to Count uh, Punch Cowan that he hadn't received the instruction to withdraw. All the while, his patrols were, were reporting that a significant Japanese advance was coming through the hills. And it wasn't until the 14th of March that his division began to withdraw out of Tidham. He had 16,000 troops, he had 2,500 vehicles, and he had 3,500 mules. This was a quite significant operation to withdraw. Remember, there was no plan to withdraw in contact. Now, this is his reserve division. He had one fully formed brigade, the 49th Brigade, and in fact that worked. On this, uh, in the days following the 7th, Schoons became more and more concerned that a significant advance was going to be developing against Tidham. So he sent the 49th Brigade down from Imphal, um, down the Imphal Road here, here we are, down here, uh, the Tidham Road rather, in order to be able to help extricate the 17th Division. General Punch Cowan, by the way, made his own unilateral decision on the 14th to withdraw. And he, as, he, as he was withdrawing his division out of Tidham, the official order came to withdraw. So what he found himself in was a battle to, uh, in contact, a withdrawal in contact rather, all the way up through to, um, to Imphal. Now the important thing is, as I said, the British had no plans to undertake a fighting withdrawal because it, fighting withdrawals are very, very hard. It's very hard to maintain your morale. It's very hard to maintain control of a battle where you're withdrawing 
and you're fighting at the same time. It's very, very difficult. Very, very few occasions has it ever been successful. But just quickly going back to Mutikuchi, the reason why he wanted um, all the effort, there was no other activity going on between the 7th and the 14th from the Japanese. They were waiting on the eastern side of the Chindwin until the 14th when uh, General um, Cowan began to withdraw his division from Tidim. On the 14th began the major crossing of the Chindwin, as has been described um, earlier. And the 31st Division, way in the north, started crossing, uh, aiming for Kahima. And the 15th Division also started crossing, as did Yamamoto Force. And Yamamoto Force, just if you don't know, each Japanese division had two generals, a lieutenant general and a major general. The lieutenant general was in command of the division. He was the GOC, and the major general was responsible for the infantry. Yamamoto was Yanagida's uh, infantry commander, and he was given responsibility for placing pressure here at a place called Tamu in order to build up the idea in the British minds that the major Japanese thrust was coming from the south and the southeast. So just to recap, the 7th, the Japanese started moving up into Tidim. Four to seven days later, exactly a week later, they began crossing in strength here and up the Chindwin here around Homelin and north, aiming for Kahima. So all of a sudden, General Schoons and General Slim had the threat of um, significant Japanese attacks from a number of, of um, positions. And from the 14th through to the 15th, 16th, and finishing on the 18th, the Japanese put significant pressure on the troops around here. And the British troops at Tamu was the 20th Indian Division, as, as you've been told. Three brigades, raised in Ceylon in 1942, uh, commanded by Douglas Gracie, a very, very fine division. Great fighting strength uh, and, and power. 33, 80, and 100 brigades. Now, the, the British only had a very small garrison, 1,500 men in Kahima, because they, according to Slim's plan, didn't believe that the Japanese would spend, send any more than a regiment to Kahima, um, and then they would possibly try to fall on Dimapur. That was a significant mistake. Remember what I said about Mutaguchi. Mutaguchi's private plan was to send a significant force to Dimapur. So in send, instead of sending simply one regiment into Kahima, he sent the whole of Sato's 31st Division, not simply to defeat the British at Kahima, but to push on down into Dimapur. So let me just quickly tell you the story. We're now on the 14th of March. Um, the British 20th uh, Division here in, in this area here at Tamu was being uh, pressed by the Japanese. A very important point to make at this, at this stage is that the Japanese were exhibited some very strange behaviors. Um, they rushed their troops into battle. They didn't coordinate infantry, artillery, and tanks very well. The British defenders, the 20th Brigade defenders at Tamu, killed lots of Japanese who were recklessly throwing themselves into battle. Now, this is 1944. This shouldn't be happening. The Japanese must have learnt all the lessons from 1942. But a backstory to the whole of the Battle of Imphal is that it was the Indians who had learnt the lessons of 1942 and not the Japanese. Incidentally, the first tank-on-tank -tank action in the whole of the Burma campaign occurred here on the 16th and 17th of March. Uh, as about 67 tanks, uh, Japanese medium and light tanks, crossed the Chindwin and were engaged by um, Indian, a small number of Indian Lee Grants. And to cut a long story short, the Indian tanks completely destroyed the, uh, the Japanese tanks to the extent that the Japanese tanks only thereafter played a very small role in the continued battle. So here we are. We're on the 14th, 15th, 16th of March. I'm going to have to speed up, otherwise we're not going to finish this battle. And uh, the uh, 17th Division is withdrawing north through the Tidham Road. It's very hilly, mountainous country. And the Japanese, very uh, sensibly, cut the road off with two of their regiments, 214 and 215 regiments, uh, at two places along here on the Tidham Road. 
Fortunately, Cowan, General Cowan, had decided to picket the road. By picketing, he placed companies along the road in order to protect it in the case of a withdrawal. So here he is withdrawing. Before he left Tidham, he demolished everything he could. He demolished all the bridges over the river Manipur. He placed booby traps and IEDs on the road. He, 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 he mined the roads extensively. To the extent that, now remember that we were told earlier that the aim was to get the 33rd Division into Imphal by the Emperor's birthday on the 28th of March. It was only on the 23rd of March that the Japanese 33rd Division was able to get out of Tidham because of the mining and the demolitions that had taken place. That had, that had set the Japanese timetable back two weeks. But more significantly, what it did was it depressed the morale of General Yanagida. By the 23rd, just getting out of Tidham with all his vehicles being blown up by mines, men being killed by IEDs, his two, uh, the, the two uh, blocks, two by two on four and two on five regiments, weren't doing a particularly good job because um, Pakawan's pickets were fighting them off. They were fighting them off with uh, air power as well, which we'll hear about in a moment by Pushy. The Gurkha brigades were slowly advancing north, clearing the Japanese from the roads. They were using artillery well. They weren't being defeated in the way the Japanese thought the Brits had always been defeated in the past. Another example of not learning lessons. So here we have, over the, the next few weeks, a story of the 17th Division slowly fighting its way back, in contact, degrading the Japanese to a significant extent, such that Japanese morale started to fall. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the battle. It's going to take time. Let me explain that by about the 23rd or 24th of March, so not very long after Yanagida had actually left, the main part of his division had left Tidham, he was uh, effectively sacked by General Mutaguchi and his fearsome deputy, the man with the big whiskers up there, uh, Colonel T Tanaka, was placed in command instead. And General Yanagida played a very small role in the battle thereafter. As an aside, Japanese uh, command relationships were very, very poor indeed, and Mutaguchi and Yanagida didn't get on. So, the first part of the Japanese plan wasn't going to plan because of very, very significant um, Indian resistance by the 17th Division. Remember also the 49th Brigade had been sent down to set up a block at a place called uh, Milestone 82, which is about there. And they set up a very big box, a defensive box, waiting for the 7th, 17th Division to come into it. And thereafter, uh, between then and the end of March, the four brigades, two brigades from the 17th Division and two brigades that had come down to help, basically dog-legged back in a defensive, um, series of defensive postures, degrading the Japanese all the way to the extent that by the end of March, 30th of March, there was very little actually left of the 33rd Division. Now, we're not going to dismiss the 33rd Division just yet, because if you know anything about the Japanese soldier, you know that they will fight on right until the end. So although they had been significantly degraded as a military force, they were still very powerful. Now, that's actually re uh, the easy bit. The big surprise, the sting in the tail for the British, remember those four dates I gave you, the 4th, the 14th, the 17th, and the 30th. On the 17th of March, whilst all this activity was going around on in the south, the British started getting messages that Japanese troops were being seen in force in the area of Sangshak, up here. So north, up here, northeast of Imphal, in a place where the British did not expect any Japanese to be. So just remember the British expected the Japanese to go straight for Kohima, but Mutaguchi's plan, whilst putting a lot of pressure on the British in Tidham and at Tamu, was actually to send an entire division. Remember this is General Yamauchi's 15th division, very powerful force, all the way up to fall on Imphal from the north. And the plan was to cut the road to Kihima by about the 30th of March and then attack in a surprise attack on the north. It very, very nearly succeeded. The reason it didn't succeed is because two very weak battalions, one Gurkha, one Indi Indian of the 50th Indian Parachute Brigade 
under a 31-year-old brigadier called Hope Thompson, stopped them at Sang Shack. And it's very important just to spend a few minutes talking about Sang Shack, a forgotten battle, but the linchpin to the success of Imphal. If it wasn't for Sang Shack, um, Imphal may well have fallen very, very quickly. These two battalions were resting in the area of Sang Shack. They weren't in defensive positions at all. They weren't expecting the Japanese to turn up. Uh, but all of a sudden, uh, from the 17th onwards, news began of large numbers of Japanese coming through the jungle, through a road, across a road that the British knew about but had discounted. To cut a long story short, the Sang Shack battle took four days. Uh, virtually all of the 50th in, uh, Indian Brigade, Parachute Brigade, had been, was destroyed, but they caused about a thousand Japanese casualties, held the Japanese up for four days, also distracted them from Kahima, so that when the 30th Division got to, Sato's Division got to Kahima, it was short of about um, a battalion and a half of men and had been delayed by three or four days. Just think of that, if you know anything about Kahima, the first Japanese troops got to Kahima on the 4th of April. If it hadn't been for Sang Shak, they would have been there at the end of March and it wasn't defended. Kahima could have fallen in a day. So th that's the whole point about uh, plans uh, falling into disarray when the enemy is encountered. I'm just going to say one more thing before I sit down. After Sang Shak, the 15th Division, Yamauchi's Division, um, carried on very bravely in attempting to attack into the northern part of Imphal. And in a previous seminar we heard this morning um, about the uh, Battle of Nung Chigam, very famous battle with a, 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 a very narrow ridge where Japanese tanks and, uh, sorry, British or Indian tanks and Japanese infantry engaged a thousand feet above the, the plain. Quite an extraordinary battle. That's as far as the Japanese got into Imphal in 1944 from the north. So here we are, we've got by the end of March, 30th of March, the Japanese had cut the road to Imphal, they had uh, defeated the very light forces at Sang Shak, they, had, they were massing around Nunchigom, they were defeated at Nunchigom, but they started then and they had got all the way up to Bishampur in the south. They hadn't met their objective of seizing Imphal before the Emperor's birthday. And at that stage, the battle of attrition really began. This is a, a battle in which def, um, the Japanese settled down into defensive positions in the north and the hills between Nunchigom and Ukral um, and around Bishampur. And they fought in those two areas uh, between early April through to August. By the end of uh, the, the fighting in July and early August, and when uh, the Japanese were ordered to withdraw, they were eating grass. They had no food left. When they advanced on Imphal in March 1944, they carried food for 21 days. The expectation is that they would be able to seize what they described as the Churchill rations. British rations left for them as their enemy escaped, so they hoped. The one part of the battle I haven't yet described is the battle of the 20th Division on the Shenham Heights. Of course, as the Sang Shak battle uh, developed, Schoons in the heart at Imphal realized that he couldn't leave the 20th Brigade out at Tamu um, alone and unsupported. So he ordered Douglas Gracie, much to Douglas Gracie's annoyance, to withdraw his three brigades up the Shenham Road from uh, Tamu to the Shenham Heights, which sit overlooking uh, the Imphal Plain, and to hold the Shenham Heights from the Japanese. Douglas Gracie did that. Again, it was a series of battles uh, in withdrawal. And by the time that uh, the 80th and the 100th Brigade had got up to the top of the Shenham Saddle and began to create defensive positions, which uh, would uh, contain or w which would engage the Japanese all the way through to August, the 33rd Brigade went down into reserve in Imphal. So here we have the story of the Battle of Imphal. It didn't go as the Japanese had planned. Enormous casualties had been, um, had, uh, Japanese had taken enormous casualties. They were completely surprised by the fierceness of the Indian resistance to them. It wasn't something they expected. And it 
created for the first time in the, the Indian Army something they had not experienced before. In all the fighting since 1931 in Manchuria and China, they had never experienced a, a formation losing its morale. Now this is very important. The Japanese morale around uh, uh, Imphal started to collapse. It didn't mean they stopped fighting, but they fought with a different sort of fierceness. And the fierceness that they engaged in now was a fierceness to die. And this is important that we all understand this. The attrition that began in April and followed through to May and June 1944 was a war in which the Japanese knew they weren't going to break into Imphal, but they wanted to die with honor. It's something that's very hard for us to understand, but it's the only way in which we can understand the fierce attrition of Imphal. Finally, and I will sit down after this, when the um, Japanese were defeated in those long battles in May, June, July 1944, and the remnants began to fall back, the basic estimate of numbers is something like this. The Japanese themselves think that about 100,000 men in the 15th Army crossed the Chinwin or was involved in supporting the, uh, the three main divisions going into uh, Kohima and Imphal. Probably about 60,000 fighting men with about 40,000 men in, in reserve. Of those 100,000 men, around about 60,000 died. So this was a, an incredible slaughter, a slaughter that the Japanese had never experienced before. And when it comes to questions, I'll just talk about the legacy later on of the, and the impact of the Battle of Kohima in the Japanese mind today, because the Japanese regard their defeat by the Indians in 1944 to be their most significant defeat in their entire military history. So for that reason, India needs to be, in my view, uh, appreciative, more than it is now, of the dramatic successes that its army achieved in 1944. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand back to uh, AP. Thanks, Rob. That was a rather quick description of that long battle. But and I like the way you brought out those four important dates. It now we'll stay with the audience for a long, long time. But it's important for all of us to remember that all this fighting was happening simultaneously on the circumference of that wheel and along the spokes of that wheel as they were trying to tighten in onto Imphal. Uh, all this time, the troops were asking for more ammunition. They were short of supplies, screaming for reinforcements and yelling out for air support. A great significant role in defeating the Japanese was not only from the ground, but also from the air. Air played a vital role in disrupting Japanese attacks and concentration the logistic columns behind. They say the Japanese army finally lost because they, it's not because they lost the will to fight as Rob brought out, they just did not have the rations, they starved, they actually starved and could not fight anymore. Now that was the significant contribution of air to the operations. To dwell further on the operations by the Air Force, uh, I'll hand you over to Pushpinda Chopra, who will talk of the air battle in Imphal. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take that and take Right. Uh, and those of us who were not here this morning, I'd like to flag something that happened in a session, same <clears throat> hall, very animated and quite passionate actually. It was about the air strike on Balakot, 26th of February this year. So we're talking something that happened 75 years ago. Uh, 75 years ago, and it didn't last 27 hours. <laughs> it lasted 15 months. So the point really is that air has always been a decisive factor in battles. Uh, things have changed a bit. Balakot was just a, we'll show you. And the next morning, the other side said, well, we'll show you too. The whole thing was over in 27 hours, and uh, whether any lessons were learnt or anything proved, I don't know. But here I am to just talk to you about what happened 75 years ago <clears throat> during the battles for Imphal and Kohima. The air certainly took a, a, a major part in ensuring the defeat of the Japanese and I'll now go to read some of my notes.
Okay, so here's actually a bird's eye view of the battle, or a hurricane eye view, as you like. The air aspects of the battles for Imphal and Imphal. I'll do a generally a two uh, <clears throat> part thing very quickly. First, a general part, and then what the Indian Air Force did. A very young Indian Air Force, and they <clears throat> cut their teeth in battle, and they were very sharp teeth. In fact, the squadron that took part is uh, number one squadron, which we call the Tigers, and so they were called the Tigers of Imphal. <clears throat> right, uh, my colleagues have talked about the details of what, how the land battle uh, uh, <coughs> played out. Um, there are six airstrips in the Imphal Valley. Three were permanent, and I don't know where this is. That's the general topo. You've seen much better maps. So I'll come. Uh, I'm just, okay. This is the Imphal Valley. <clears throat> there were six airfields, airstrips. Three were pretty good, and they were all weather, and the rest were a bit uh, kacha, as you'll see some from the photographs I'm going to show you. Uh, the, they, they were surrounded by the jungles. <clears throat> Of the six airstrips, Imphal Main to the north was the most important. Then with Tulihal and Palel in the south, they were all weather strips. Smaller landing grounds were at Bangjing, Sampan, and Kangla, all surfaced by virtually sacks covered with bitumen. Uh, at Imphal, apart from the four core headquarters, were number 221 Group, <coughs> Royal Air Force, while in the valley itself were two very famous squadrons who got together in the northwest frontier flying Wapatis and then here they were in Imphal flying hurricanes together. It was number one squadron of the Indian Air Force and number 28 squadron of the Royal Air Force. And they were both uh, tasked for tactical reconnaissance and of course uh, ground attack where opportunities lent itself. There were other Royal Air Force squadrons but in Palel, <coughs> 34 and 42. And there was 136 squadron at Sapam. And there were many other squadrons outside the valley flying bulky vengeance dive bombers. Now, here's an interesting aside. The bulky vengeance dive bomber was developed by the Americans, but they didn't want it. The U.S. Air Force said we don't want it. So it ended up with the Royal Air Force, the Royal Australian Air Force, and the Indian Air Force, and they were used with great <coughs> uh, effect. Okay. Um, <coughs> of course, there was a lot of other air around, but outside the Imphal Valley, but I'll allude to them quickly. There were medium and heavy bomber squadrons with B-24s, B-25s, Billingtons, and they went mostly in the Bengal area. <clears throat> and uh, the first Spitfires were coming in as the Japanese started uh, uh, playing havoc with the underarmed or under outperforming the Hurricanes then. So the Japanese had their own air, the, the 5th Air Division, committed for air support. And uh, those of you who are uh, military aircraft buffs, you know, there were Kawa Kawasaki Ki-48 and Mitsubishi Ki-21s, and then Nakajima Ki-43s, <laughs> and then we had a lot of zeros, and they were very good. Uh, so as the Japanese advance continued, the Indian 5th Division was flown in from the Arakan to enforce him fall, and uh, the Japanese aircraft were playing hell. They kept intercepting the uh, Allied transport aircraft, and the Hurricane were outgunned. The Spitfires were sort of uh, turning the odds, and a sort of mini battle of Britons were fought over the Imphal Valley. Uh, most of the dogfights were at very low level, especially over the Kobor uh, Valley and the Imphal Plains, and the uh, multi-vengeances were very vulnerable, but they did a fantastic job. There's a joke here. As an Indian Air Force guy was quoted, he says, as I was going down, I found the target going up. They were flying very low. <clears throat> okay, so we carry on from here up to the fact that, uh, <clears throat> uh, don't forget also the United States Army Air Force was flying uh, hundreds of missions over the hump to try to keep the Chinese in the war. And they, those aircraft had to be protected from the Japanese as well. Uh, 
Air movements were very brisk, rapid in the Imphal areas. The aircraft were flying in troops and supplies and flying out casualties. And um, the Japanese kept trying to interdict these uh, aircraft. <clears throat> now, an, a very important part was, therefore, to destroy the Japanese aircraft on ground as they were uh, interfering with the battles. <clears throat> so, in this manner, in the course of three months, and this is pretty good, 121 Japanese aircraft were destroyed on the ground, uh, a few in the air, and this forced the Japanese to abandon the airfields as far as Heho and uh, Miktila. And so by the end of May 1944, the Japanese aircraft had withdrawn to airfields around Rangoon, so they were far away from the battle. That the air forces gave substantial support to the ground forces during the actual fighting is uh, no-brainer. <clears throat> the Japanese advance towards Imphal via the Tamu and Tidim roads and towards Kohima through the Somra hills and from Humalin via Ukhrul. So close air support was continuously provided with eight Royal Air Force and Indian Air Force vengeance dive bombers while Hari bombers attacked the uh, Japanese along the Imphal Tidim road and um, tried to destroy the roadblock set up in various places. Um, I, you know, this is about it. It happened. Now I want to concentrate on the role of the Tigers of Imphal. <clears throat> uh, the Indian Air Force was very small, was very young. Uh, it had a total of maybe six hurricane squadrons uh, forming slowly. Uh, and they were still tasked with watch and ward over the northwest frontier of India. Uh, and the early, well, just go back a bit to before the, this campaign, uh, the number one squadron actually cut their teeth in the first Burma campaign when, again, with number 28 squadron Royal Air Force, they were positioned in Burma to support the uh, army there uh, during the 1942 period and they were both flying Lysanders. Now, Lysander is hardly an aeroplane to take on zeros, but they did, and they did a great job. Well, after the retreat, they were reformed, got hurricanes, and this is where the story begins. Now, they were down in um, <coughs> Kohat, which is now in Pakistan, and they were operating hurricanes when uh, the Commander-in-Chief Indian Army, <coughs> Field Marshal Sir Claude Auchinleck, visited the Royal Air Force Station there, and he also inspected the Indian Number One Squadron. And he was most impressed by their standards and spirit. And when then squadron leader Arjun Singh, who was commanding the squadron, advocated the intense desire to go back into battle, uh, the Royal Air Force Station commander gave full support, and within a week, Number One Squadron were ordered to move immediately to Imphal. Now, so they were, the war hadn't come to Imphal, but they were. Uh, already in that area, and the next 15 months were breathless with action, and uh, the, uh, the, the, there are lots to be said, but I won't uh, uh, bore you with detail. That's Arjun Singh, who later became Marshal of the Air Force. <clears throat> He's commanding number one squadron, I must have been all of 30 years old, and here one of his uh, uh, Officers describing how the steep dive bombing was going on in that area. Uh, so coming back to what they did, they immediately went into uh, operational flying with sector reconnaissance flown, offensive tactical photographic sorties to observe Japanese movements on the Chindwin beyond Tidin, and as far east as the Miktela Mandalay Railway, and lots of information was obtained. Uh, I won't bore you with details, but uh, <clears throat> when the war, when the offensive began, <clears throat> uh, number one squadron was thrown into the action uh, to keep track of the retreating, our retreating troops from day to day, drop messages to the divisional headquarters at Milestone 126, and observe how the Japanese advance was going on. Uh, I mentioned to you about the, the state of the runways. Now, don't forget, monsoons can be very uh, uh, strong and the, the runway would frequently get uh, bogged down like we noticed yesterday here in Chandigarh. 
you couldn't walk and here they had to operate. Uh, regardless of that, they kept very high serviceability <clears throat> and, uh, and operated. And there's one particular reference I want to make where, in fact, number one squadron uh, operated day and, I mean, virtually at night, fighting in the very thick jungle hills. And uh, one evening, I think early, early on, 10 aircraft of the squadron took part uh, in the fighting at Pukhau, Pukhau which is uh, near uh, 24 miles west of Shangshe. And fighting in the thick jungle hills was confused. And that evening, during a late reconnaissance flown by Arjun Singh himself, the Japanese troops were seen clambering down the hills. He landed back at Imphal, Maine to refuel and took the entire squadron into the area before sunset. The hurricanes hammered the enemy with machine guns and bombs, decimating the entire Japanese advance division. And confirmation was that 14 officers and 270 men were killed, as was confirmed. So this really staggered the advance. So they were not just flying reconnaissance, but they were actually killing Japanese. <clears throat> In uh, March 1944, the squadron flew 366 sorties, and of course, they also suffered casualties. Uh, they had many casualties, not only because of the Japanese, but because of the tricky terrain and the, and the, and the weather. And uh, they carried on to the maximum extent and they flew 485 hours in April. Uh, the Tidim, Palail, Tamu, Sitong, and Imphal Kohima roads and the Ukhril area were constantly observed by number one squadron on tactical reconnaissance. There was a Japanese air raid in retaliation on Imphal, Maine on the 15th of April, and number one squadron suffered two aircraft lost on ground, but they went back the next day, spotted Japanese tanks near Midthami and immediately attacked them, and so on. So there was, you know, lots of action. In May 1944, the battle was now raging. Number one squadron's aircraft range over virtually the entire battlefield. In the area northwest of Imphal, where the Japanese 15th Division was gradually being pushed back, and number one squadron flew many sorties to locate Allied troops and pin defense points of the Japanese, similarly in the Palel area. 1944, June, was a very trying month for, you see the, the state of the uh, tarmac, or whatever you like to call it, and it reminds you of what happened here yesterday. Uh, the monsoon had created many difficulties. The runways were often waterlogged. Storms made flying hazardous. Clouds and rains hampered visibility and returning pilots of, often found it difficult to locate their airstrips. Uh, <clears throat> reconnaissance work anyway continued. But uh, the sister squadron, number 28 squadron, Royal Air Force, were pulled out of Imphal in the course of June. I don't know the reason, but uh, maybe logistics. But number one squadron then assumed the sole responsibility for tactical reconnaissance in this vital area, flying hundreds of sorties, taking photographs, special tasks, weather reconnaissance, all in the face of adverse weather. If you've been to a SAM area in winter, in the monsoons, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, meanwhile, the Hurricane 2 Bs were replaced by the Hurricane 2 Cs, which had 20 millimeter cannon and uh, carried out uh, some very effective ground attack. <clears throat> um, so, June, number one squadron continued to operate over the Imphal Kohima Road where the battle was raging for clearing the road. The 5th Indian Division had fought its way up the Kohima Road from Imphal where the 2nd British Division moved down the road from Kohima, as we all know, and finally, uh, the link-up took place. The siege of Imphal was finally broken and the Japanese 15th and 31st divisions began to disintegrate. Uh, although the, the, the opening up the Imphal-Kohima road didn't stop number one squadron hurricanes being involved, 
in addition to their tasks by doing reconnaissance of the Japanese lines of communication and strafing their retreating troops. The main effort was in the Ukrol area. You see the saint. And uh, where, the high, where the hilly jungle terrain made observation very difficult. And the Tamu, Tahan, Tahan, Lungchong roads came under constant observation. Uh, so the Japanese are broken and the Allies are advancing and the Indian Air Force Hurricanes and the Royal Air Force Spitfires and other aircraft are uh, moving ahead. That's, uh, <clears throat> I think that's uh, the RAF, uh, the AOC Headquarters India, Air Commodore Proud with number one squadron and squadron leader Arjun Singh visiting the <clears throat> unit. Now the uh, last is the best. <clears throat> Impressed by his leadership uh, in war, I mean, Arjun Singh's leadership had a distinct style, quiet courage, no flamboyance, firmness with a ready smile. After the Japanese had been thrown back in a great and magnanimous honor to him, and indeed the very infant Indian Air Force, Lord Louis Man Mountbatten personally flew to Imphal and in the presence of Air Chief Marshal Sir Richard Pierce and the assembled Tigers of the airfield, he pinned the Distinguished Flying Cross on Arjun Singh's tunic. They celebrated, of course, but it's not what you think. They only drank tea. Uh, and in the words of Mountbatten about Arjun Singh, all he said is he had done a great job. That's my amateur way of telling you where the <laughs> airfields were. And uh, they still exist, and I think my friend uh, Bobby, uh, the, there are two airfields in the Imphal Valley. One is the main one where you can fly yes. uh, out of Delhi every morning. Uh, that is Tuli Halayafil. Yeah. Thank you. That is Tuli Halayafil. Thank you so much, sir. The Indian National Army also took part in this battle, and no account of the Imphal battle will be complete if we don't mention the small but minuscule part that they did play in this battle. The first division of the INA, comprising of the Gandhi, Azad and Subhash brigades, totaling about 6,000 men, participated in the battle. There were also small groups called Bahadur groups, which were basically special task groups ranging from about 100 to 150 men, who moved around with the Japanese divisions and acted as guides or as uh, uh, propagandists ahead of them in the jungles of India. Uh, the nearest that they ever came to any action was on a Palel Road where parties came in disguised as local inhabitants, entered villages towards Palel and they swarmed the hillsides which one almost reached the Palel Keep which was the main logistic dump of Palel. But that's about all but the, when the retaliation came from the Gurkhas it was very swift and very very uh, strong and most of the uh, uh, most of that part of the Gandhi and Azad brigades disintegrated at that time. But as it is said, Imphal was the battle, the INA was created and waiting for to train, to try and liberate India militarily from the British rule. This was their aim. It was to be the start point of the march to Delhi. And as the first debts were rushed up to Manipur, where they were in the vanguard of the offensive of 33 Div in 1944, they were ill-equipped, under-trained, very high on motivation, but they were just not ready for the terrain at hand and the task at hand. They were totally dependent on Japanese for their logistic supplies and the Japanese themselves were very hard, hard put for their own logistic supplies. So there were a large amount of failings. Today at Mairang, there is the INA memorial, which is the only INA memorial in the world which stands there and that spot where the planning was done is still preserved. There at this spot, the INA men of the Bahadur group under one Colonel S. A. Malik hoisted in the INA Army's flag for the first time on Indian soil on 14th April 1944. This now is commemorated by the Moirang War Memorial there. It is also the spot where the advance headquarters of the INA moved when the Manipur battle and the Naga Hills battle was started. Just a quick mention of the INA. Uh, I'd like to go back to Rob now. Uh, you were mentioning that there was a leadership crisis in the uh, Japanese. So if you could quickly touch upon that as to how that precipitated the 
losses that they suffered at uh, Kohima and Imphal before we finally conclude? I just have two quick points to, to make and if you've been to previous seminars on Kohima and Slim, you would have heard me discuss them before. But one of the reasons for the Japanese failure was the, Jap was the failure of Japanese leadership. Motoguchi had a very poor relationship with Yanagidi, Yamauchi and Sato. It wasn't just poor, it was, um, it was destructive to the extent that the divisional commanders really didn't want to follow orders from Motoguchi. And as the battle degenerated, on the ground, it also de degenerated within the command structure itself. And we, we need to understand this to appreciate part of the Japanese failure. What they encountered in Imphal and Kohima was so against their expectations that they were unable to deal with it at a command level. So one of the critical functions in training for higher command is being able to ensure that plans are well articulated, alternatives are developed, commanders understand how to communicate with each other and to speak honestly with each other. And just to give you a little example, uh, when Motoguchi uh, felt that it was time to withdraw, there was about a three week period when Motoguchi wanted to withdraw the army from, um, from the Imphal area. He traveled to Rangoon to try to talk to General Kuabe to explain that what he wanted to do, but he couldn't articulate it verbally. So he was hoping that his thoughts would so impress his, his senior commander that his senior commander would understand what was in his mind without verbalizing them. Because he, he could not say, I want to withdraw my troops. He wanted his commanding officer to say, I understand the trouble you're in, why don't we withdraw the army? And that inability to talk to each other, frankly, led to disaster. My final point really is a point I touched on earlier. If you go to Japan and you ask Japanese um, about their military history, they will tell you that Imphal was the battle that provokes the most emotion when they consider their military history. Not Guadalcanal or Okinawa or Iwo Jima in the Second World War, it's Imphal. And yet if you travel around India, outside of the Indian Army, and outside of Manipur, and perhaps even in Manipur itself, you find no one, literally no one, knows anything about Imphal or Kohima. That's one of the tragedies of today, and it's something that you all need to uh, change and reverse. I'll do my bit, and we'll do our bit by trying to promote the, the, the remembrance of these significant Indian battles in 1944, at a time when India was invaded by Japan. But it's something that we all have to do together. Thank you, Rob. Uh, with that, I'd just like to conclude by saying, uh, as Rob brought out, when we started in 1939, entered World War II, the Indian Army was about 300,000 men strong. But by the time the war ended in 1945, the number went up to 2 million. So it probably was the largest volunteer army in the world. And during the Second World War, it was the largest volunteer army that participated in the Second World War. And the only place the Second World War was fought on Indian soil was in Imphal and Kohima. So that's a huge, huge thing. I think we must all commemorate uh, both the battles of Kohima and Imphal. We've had two wonderful discussions yesterday on Kohima, today on Imphal, and a discussion on uh, Field Marshal Slim. Uh, uh, this, the 75th year of the commemoration of uh, the Burma campaign, is something where, which we use to pay tribute to the people who fought both the armies, the Japanese, the British, the Indian, and the uh, various other races which came in and fought here at Kohima and Imphal. With that, I'd like to... <laughs> yes. Uh, no... Um, uh, and today, to understand what happens in, in at uh, what happened at uh, Imphal and Kohima we have something called the battlefield tour companies and uh, Arambam along with uh, I think his friend Heman Singh Katoch uh, run uh, one of the few battlefield tour companies which take you on to tours of the battlefields of both Kohima and Imphal and um, it's I think a really wonderful initiative which needs maximum support he has a large amount of Japanese subscribers who come there to to see the land where their ancestors fought so bravely and uh, perished and I think that um, 
this, uh, this is something that we should also promote and all the best to you, Ramam. I'm sure your venture will do very well. With that, I think we'll come to the end. Thank my panel. If there are any questions, I know it's getting late. I know you're all cold in the feet. Uh, if there are any questions, we'll try and answer them. Yeah, you. Uh, I wanted to ask this question in the last session, but, uh, uh, but let me take this opportunity uh, now. So, uh, and this question is for you, uh, uh, General Epi, uh, because uh, you are the only one who can answer this question properly. Uh, uh, because, uh, because, because it is related to the Indian Army. Now, uh, in the, in the present day, what I feel honestly is the young generation of Indian Army officers hardly know about the significance of the Battle of Imphal and Kohima. They might have heard, it, heard about it uh, uh, from their regimental diaries and then uh, in the officers' mess from the battle honors, but they don't know the significance. I have seen my friends who are st uh, serving in the Indian Army. They hardly know about it. So, uh, uh, but we need to know them, as you already know. But, uh, like, but what do we do about this? What do you think about this? Thanks. I think I started off this presentation saying that this was the only battle that actually in World War II that touched the shores of India. The only battles where Indians fought Indians. With the INA being on the Japanese side and with the Indian uh, soldiers being on the uh, part of the British and Indian Army, it is the only place in the world where Indians fought Indians. Uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very significant thing. It's, it's something which should draw attention of every Indian and uh, be it pride or be it just uh, learning from the mistakes of jungle warfare made by the Japanese and, and we did make some mistakes too. Uh, I think it's a very important battle. But to, to set the record right, uh, we do study uh, the battles of Kohima and Imphal. They are part of the promotion examinations. They are part of the uh, Defense Services Staff College entrance examinations, Field Marshal Slim's biography, and the Burma campaign, especially defeat into victory, was, I can personally say, my battle study when I appeared for Staff College. So, yes, it is part of that professional study that happens. But are we doing enough? I agree with you. I think we need to do much more. It's not just in promotion examinations and in competitive examination that you need to study about these battles. You have to take a certain kind of pride, a certain kind of... Uh, uh, certain kind of uh, belief that our army started off believing in itself and grew as uh, just like Brigadier Al Manson brought out that uh, regimental system, the Indian and British army uh, regimental system that came from there and that belief that we can we fight for the regiment, the flag of the regiment is the most important. I think that was the one thing that brought us in. And uh, while it was so, what you're saying was so about 10 years ago, not so much now. I think books like the one by Rob Lyman and the studies that we are doing now and the battlefield tours which have started happening about four or five years ago are bringing these battles, though long ago, bringing them fresh into everybody's memory. So as the generations progress, I'm sure we will study more about these and there's much more to be done and there's, I think there's much more being written. I'd like to add to that. I think there's a lot more that um, we, I keep saying we in the British Army, I left ages ago, but still think of myself in, in uniform. Uh, you know, so much of, of what we've heard today um, got into the ethos of the British Army um, through Slim. Um, and, and funnily enough, it'd be worth digging back to find out where it came from, to reinforce the ethos, if, if, if I'm making sense there. And I think that it, it is coming. The 75th anniversary has helped a, a, a lot, but also it's one of the, as I said yesterday, uh, when we talked about Kohima, one of the perverse effects, uh, one of the benign effects of the otherwise perverse business of the British Army getting smaller is as the regiments have amalgamated, um, the experience and the pride in, in the resistance uh, in these battles that certain regiments of the British Army 
took part in has been brought into the new amalgamations, so regiments that had never really considered Kohima and Imphal uh, at all because they weren't there now find um, themselves in, in the amalgamated regiment to have had antecedents who were there, and so the regiment becomes um, of interest. But, but really, just to finish quickly, the, the, the final uh, the, the final value, as it were, of, of Kohima and Imphal to the story of the British Army today is that, as I said yesterday, um, it reinforced uh, in, in the minds of the, um, uh, of, of the chief of the Imperial s staff in London and the, uh, the, the political masters in London uh, that, that Slim was a general of, of considerable ability. Um, when in 1945 um, war was over, uh, Slim was actually straight away fairly quickly forgotten. He was sidelined in a, in a teaching job almost, running the Royal College of Defense Studies, and then uh, it came to retire as a lieutenant general and made second in command of the new nationalized British Railways. It was only in 1948 when General Montgomery, who took over as chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, moved on to be um, part of the new NATO setup, and a new CGS needed to be found. The, the original proposal for General Crocker, one of Montgomery's subordinates um, in, in Europe, and Montgomery's nomination, when that went up to the, the ministers of the new Labour government, um, they said, no, we're not really happy about this. What about this, what about this man Slim that, um, you know, did, did so well in, in, at Imphal and Kohima and the liberation of, of Burma? And so instead, um, Crocker was told, sorry, you're not going to be chief of the Imperial General Staff, and Slim received a telephone call at the headquarters of the new British Railways saying, back into uniform, Slim, we're promoting you Field Marshal, you're going to be Chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, and Slim shaped the army of the 50s uh, and the 60s. It's, it's one of those extraordinary, you know, the, the fortunes of war, and so that for the British Army today is, is probably the, the most long-lasting um, impact that Imphal and Kohima had. We have two more questions. One you and then one the lady out there, please. Namaskar. My name is Hindi. Please, we will speak in Hindi. Sir, my name is Dr. Surendri Adav. And my name is Palada, District Jajjar. Captain Umrao Singh Adav was my Tauzi. So, my request is that as long as you are doing this kind of work here, if we are doing this kind of work in our village, हमारे आस पड़ोस में हो जाएं तो एक प्रेरणा मिले लोगों को जैसे मैं अभी लिखता हूं कैप्टन उमराव सिंह की वीरता की कहानी उन्होंने मेरे से लिखवाई थी और मैंने उसको पब्लिश किया है बीते साल निकोड सर थे और इनकी टीम को मैंने दी थी अजय योद्धा करके हिंदी में छपी थी एक और पुस्तक मैंने लिखी थी हरियाणा के विक्टोरिया क्रास विजेता रणबाकुरे जिसमें छः विक्टोरिया क्रास जो हरियाणा के थे उनका वर्णन है सब में तो एक तो मेरा यही रिक्वेस्ट है कि एक जो मेरा इलाका है इस आगे का इलाका आहिरवाल पड़ता है वहाँ भी काफ़ी संख्या में सैनिकों की खान कह, कहें तो उसमें अतिशोक्ति नहीं होगी तो एक ये इस तरह के कार्यक्रम अगर उधर हों तो और ज़्यादा प्रेरणा मिलेगी उमराव सिंह जी का योगदान जैसे उन्होंने मुझसे लिखवाई बातें तो वो भी कम पढ़े लिखे थे तो काफ़ी सारी चीज़ें रह गई थी कुछ समृति से उनको विस्मृत भी हो गई थी तो एक तो मेरा ये है कि कुछ अगर मुझे और मेटेरियल मिल जाए तो उस पुस्तक को और उसमें सुधार किया जा सकता है उसमें और थोड़ी सी प्रमाणिकता आ जाएगी उन्होंने तो जो मुझसे बोला लिखा क्योंकि लास्ट 2004 के आसपास छः में वो उनका स्वर्गवास हो गया था तो लास्ट टाइम उन्होंने मेरे से लिखवाया था तो काफ़ी सारी ग्रामीण पृष्ठभूमि की पारिवारिक चीज़ें मैंने लिखवा दी इतने लंबे विचार के मैं पहले से आपने नाम भूल गया मैं पहले सर मेरा डॉक्टर सुरेंद्र यादव नाम है डॉक्टर सुरेंद्र डॉक्टर सुरेंद्र आपने बहुत एक बहुत अच्छा पॉइंट सामने लाया है कि हमारे जो जहाँ से हमारे फौजी हमारे सैनिक और हमारे अफसर आते हैं उनके इलाकों में इतने कहानियाँ हैं लिखने योग कि आप जैसे लोग आगे आए और उन्होंने आपने उनकी 
कहानियाँ हम हमारे जैसे युवकों तक पहुँचाया हम भी ऐसे ही कहानियाँ सुन सुन के बड़े हुए हैं और हमारी ऑर्गेनाइजर से डेफिनेटली ये दरख्वास्त रखी जाएगी कि अगर इस तरीके के प्रोग्राम ये पंजाब गवर्नमेंट और यूटी गवर्नमेंट से एक इनिशिएटिव है एक मिलिट्री लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल पंजाब गवर्नमेंट से मुझे ज़रूर उम्मीद है कि अगर हम ऐसे चीज़ें दूसरे स्टेट के गवर्नमेंट में भी पेश किया जाए और बताया जाए कि वो करें तो ऐसा कोई हर एक आदमी इस इस चांस का चांस में हिस्सा लेना चाहेगा और अपने गांव और प्रदेशों में इन 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 शूरवीरों की कहानियात को बताने के लिए उत्सुक हो गए क्योंकि सर गांव में जैसे मैं समझ आता हूँ सुरेंद्र क्वेश्चन है कि सजेशन है ये समझ गया आपकी बात हम इसके बाद में हम इसके बाद में आपसे बात करेंगे क्योंकि टाइम भी है हमारा टाइम लिमिट भी है यस मैम योर क्वेश्चन Uh, good evening. I'm Dr. Devyani. Not really a question, but an answer to your query as to how we can raise awareness about this battle, which is so important for us, and a lot of people don't know about it. So I'd also take this opportunity to highlight that uh, my uncle, Major Rizal Singh Jun from the 9th Jat Regiment, was martyred in this battle. Uh, he was at Maolong, and then in the Singbham feature, he was sent to defend it, and he was. Killed in the crossfire from a machine gun, so his name is there in the Imphal War Cemetery, and we, as kids, went to see it. But besides that, in the villages, like this gentleman also said, nobody really knows about it. So what I did was I made a Facebook page and uh, put his photos there, and all our relatives connect up. So if from your side also there could be something on that, because people don't go to libraries so much or read books, but definitely they could share. photographs and i get your point dibani very very kind of you to bring the point i think uh, what everybody needs to know sabko pata hona chahiye ki this festival has its own website and we have also uploaded all these these talks onto onto youtube and uh, it's also available live uh, being streamed live on our web page uh, this probably is on record you can always go back and play them but i think to add to your point we need to do this more in the vernacular where youth from the villages can actually pick up what we are trying to say This is a major effort. I think it's a very good idea. We need to have a start on it. Uh, but this is the third edition of the MLF, and I, we also had programs in Hindi for for the youth. We've had a we've had a very interesting session on uh, jingoism. We've also had a very interesting session on Bharat and its growth. And uh, I think as you as we grow further, the trend will pick up, and uh, some more of us will will join the will put our shoulders to the wheel. But thank you so much for a wonderful session, uh, Surinder Ji. आपका भी बधाई निवाद. Uh, so we so we wind up yeah it's about time uh, the mc says so thank you very much for all of you for being in such rapid attendance thank you to my panelists